I'll open the meeting and welcome you here to our March meeting. Um, the uh, I call on call for apologies. I think we've one from Just Councillor you. Galvin and one from the general manager. Can somebody like to move that we accept those apologies? So I move, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Carlton, Councillor Moore. Those in favour say aye. 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 Carry it. Carry it. Um, can I have somebody move the confirmation of the minutes of the previous ordinary meeting? Thank you, Councillor Regan. Second, Councillor Dixon. I got. Yeah. Uh, put that motion. Those in favour say aye. 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 Uh, carried. Now we have four presentations this morning, and uh, first one being. Uh, Paul Cornell from the uh, our auditor, and he's only across at the Roxy today. Uh, and then there is. He's in Armadale. He's in I think they're working in the Roxy. Uh, no, so the, there are auditors at the Roxy. Ah, oh, but Paul's in Armadale. Paul's in Armadale. Okay, well, Paul can probably hear all this. <laughs> uh, and then there's there's three others from uh, Recuper, which is the people that chase up our. So Debt, debts, the debts. Richard's uh, in the corner over there. Oh, right? okay. Good <laughs> uh, Richard. Well, welcome. Uh, and um, representatives from Australian Rail Track Corporation and Inland Rail, Transform Rail as well, all in the one. And then Azaria Dobson, we're making a team's presentation from Namoy JO to do with the jobs precinct that they have been awarded. So we'll kick off and I'll say, is you, you got him on? Yeah. So I've put it. I've given everyone a copy of our financial statements too oh, yeah. for a bit of bedtime reading when you can't sleep. You might want to turn around. Paul will be on the screen behind you. I might put my glasses on. Is he there? Yes. There he is. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we've done all the preliminaries, Paul, and you've actually in your. You weren't here, but in your absence, you've been introduced. <laughs> so I'll hand it straight over to you for your presentation. Okay, I was just yeah, running through an introduction, but yeah, so I've been um, here for quite a while and before the office and then um, the contract ordered afterwards. So we do the work and then uh, Chris Harper does the quality check and then reports um, in the final form. The, um, I have an apologies for Chris Harper, he can't make it today, so I'm, I'm talking on his behalf. Also, just remind councillors that um, as the auditor, we only report on the financial statements. We don't really do internal audit and look at the, sometimes the broader structures of council, but um, we'll go through the systems and controls that relate to forming an opinion on the financial statements. And we also work toward materiality measure too. So sometimes little things might slip through. That's just um, the nature of going through an audit. The report we'll talk to is the conduct of the audit report, uh, which is again combined results that includes water and sewer and no room and all those other functions together. But uh, I'll take questions really as I go if you want, or um, we'll take questions at the end. I didn't receive any formal notifications of questions to me, so I basically won't have any prep time if you do have a question to raise. To go through, we expressed an un unmodified audit opinion, which meant that we're saying that the accounts are true and fair in a material sense and comply with the local government act in terms of the reporting structure. Page 75 is where he's at. Okay. You do, know, you do know that there is some rural fire service equipment that hasn't been recorded in the accounts. There are quite a number of councils that don't record them. And it was the audit officer's opinion to raise that in the conduct of audit report um, as something to flag for you guys to look at, especially that they've come back with a decision that you should record them all. And I'm talking about the red fleet here, which is the main of the trucks. So that should be stock tapes, condition assessed, useful lives, and put some values in the accounts. In terms of the operating results, we recorded a surplus of 2.6 million for June 21. 
and that included depreciation of 8.6 million. Now, depreciation is not a cash expense at the point in time, but it's a representation of a deterioration over your infrastructure for a number of years, so your roads, bridges, buildings, etc. Um, so on that basis, you're covering off the, the longer term amortisation costs uh, on a combined basis. The results improved compared to last year, which was an increase in user charges and fees, being monies received for Transport New South Wales regarding roads. We also received some stimulus grants monies of 1.5 million higher, and that's to do with works for roads, bridges, drought affected communities, and, and some regional roads. And there was a decrease in the loss on disposal assets. This last year, there was some write offs of some swimming pools that were um, had problems with them, as well as um, some write offs in roads, buildings that were replaced earlier than what the depreciation schedule estimated. That happens quite a lot across a number of councils. Offsetting those gains, if you like, was that those materials and contract costs went up because you had more work to do. That's what their grant money was for. And you also had a decrease in other income. There was a reversal of a revaluation decrement in the 2021-20 year. So that's just a compensatory in terms of getting the revaluations um, brought into line. Linda, page 76. Now, there's a result before capital income, which is a deficit of uh, 1.5 million. The capital income is stripped out in that figure because the expense of that capital income goes into the balance sheet. So it's something that goes in as a capital item, so a new road, and then it's depreciated. So there's a bit of a mismatch. So sometimes the, it's best to look at that figure rather than look at the, the top line figure to go, well, where are you at in terms of result? Now you are in depth, and that includes water and sewer, as well as the other general functions. Though water and sewer funds were pretty much break even, so that loss was set within the, the general operations. You had an increase in rates, uh, which is good for the rate pen layouts, um, and increases in charges for water supply and domestic charges. And as I said before, um, other swings and roundabouts which I've talked about just up up. So longer term, councils should be looking at trying to balance up that figure to say break even rather than a deficit of 1.5 million. It is a challenge for regional councils because you've got 8.6 million of depreciation going through there. So that's one of the highly judgmental areas in terms of longer term financial health to match up. And um, a lot of regional councils struggle to balance that side of things in the shorter term. In terms of cash flow performance, council had a, a strong cash flow position um, and over the year. In terms of cash and investments at the end of the year, you um, had internal and unrestricted cash of 2.1 million compared to 1.5 million the year before. So you had an increase in that, that cash reserve. Some of that was increased because you got financial assistance screened in advance, which you preserved, as well as um, funds you put aside for, that were related to grants. And the external restrictions increased for that regard as well. In terms of performance measures, the operating performance ratio was negative. Uh, the benchmark is about break even. As I said before, the main reason for that is the challenges with your size council in amortisation, depreciation of your infrastructure, which is a non-cash item, but something that needs to be managed over a longer period. Your own source revenue is um, similar to last year and slightly below the ratio. Um, you had an increase in user charges, which helped in that regard. Unrestricted cash has dropped a little and it's below the benchmark of having about 1.5 times reserves. Um, you were at that level two point, uh, two, 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 in 2019, um, but there's been a lot of works and capital costs that have happened over the last two years, especially related to grants and stimulus. 
The debt service cover ratio remains strong and above the benchmark, which gives an indication that council could borrow money for longer term projects if they had to. It's more, most of the council's your size going, let's leave that as a reserve, it's something you would have to use if you had um, some immediate issues with the infrastructure to deal with. <laughs> the rates of the charges have remained low, the collection rates very good, and the cash expense cover ratio present meets the standards. In terms of infrastructure, you did spend about $7 million on renewing assets, um, slightly lower than the year before, and that didn't match the depreciation of the year by 1.6 million, as we said before, depreciation was 8.6. So that's really the highlights of the conduct of audit. We note that the council logs a little late um, compared to the 31st of October. Um, council did seek an extension to get them done, uh, and that was granted. So there were lots within those extension periods. Um, reasons for that are really just, yeah, you, know, you had problems with the building and right. building for people to be housed properly to get things done as well as just ongoing impact of COVID. So that's really the highlights of the audits. Um, happy to take any questions as you see fit. Oh, I've got one. I'll kick it off. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah I think so. Okay. Um, you made a comment, like, depreciation is a major problem, probably for all rural councils, it certainly is for us. But you made a comment about, you referred depreciation being a problem in your size council. Why would it be any different in a bigger one? What, what was your point? Um, if you look at, like, a mid-top council, sometimes councils still further than the coast, it's the population density, so your rate player base might be higher given the amount of, uh, compared to the infrastructure that needs your have. So some of those councils are able to balance their books that have their depreciation covered by rates and, and other particular revenue sources. Mm -hmm. But councils, like what I'm saying, like, say, wider compared to, will be? Uh, say, more Bungle or even more re have similar problems. Yeah. Is that they've got larger, larger areas, um, lots and lots of roads, and a, a lower rate base that's going to be able to afford to cover um, unless you have massive increases in rates, which are unpalatable at the time. That's okay, because I, I, the, the, the word that came to my mind when you said that was amalgamation. Uh, but amalgamating us with another rural council wouldn't solve the depreciation problem at all. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Go on, you go. Sorry, well, sorry, I didn't... No, I'm, I'm finished. It's you, over to you if you wanted to say anything. <clears throat> that speaker... Well, yeah, John, the it's microphone. Just, it's just a change to cut the first case and And over time, you're starting to refine the amount of cost you have with each revaluation. But it's, it's still a judgment area. And it's something that you won't find out until another 10 or 15 years. Because most councils have to look forward to what their plan works are, rather than a snapshot in time now. Um, mm. You're getting a lot of grants, a lot of stimulus to cover off on renewal works needed now. Um, so it's just really looking forward more than looking back. It's about how much wear and tear you've got to manage and have money set aside for that. Yeah, sure. Anyone have any questions? Yeah, yeah Alex. Um, Paul, Alex from the engineering department. Uh, with regards to the grant funding that we have uh, coming our way in stimulus, uh, you mentioned that it's for road renewal. In our case, um, on a lot of the projects, it's not road renewal, it's actually road upgrade. And the net result of that is that um, it, it has the potential to increase our depreciation, albeit by small amounts, uh, but the potential is there. Now, we've discussed um, what potential things can be done to help us address depreciation. It's always going to be an issue. But the question for you, and it's a little bit off script, and if you don't have an answer for me, uh, I understand that. If we go, we're sealing 50 kilometres of road um, over the next two years. 
uh, that are currently unsealed roads. Now, my understanding of the accounting standard is we have to then depreciate the asset that we've got being a sealed road, uh, which will bump up our depreciation. Now, there's nothing that binds council at the end of the useful life of those bitumen roads from maintaining them as bitumen roads. Could there be a mechanism or what, um, who would be the people to put the case to, to be main, maintaining depreciating those roads as unsealed roads, even though they're sealed, because we have no obligation to replace them as sealed roads in the future? Good question. And I could make that argument for much more than the 50 kilometres we're sealing um, over the next two years. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about this. <laughs> Pretty obvious. <laughs> so that's probably a good position paper to, for Helen and, and Co to look at, um, the engineers, because you, because yeah, really it is about the service level. Yeah, council, exactly. Rather than the engineer. So you're right. There's a seal there, but are you wanting to maintain that seal all the time? It's going to be tricky. But then you go, well, when it starts to deteriorate, I'm not going to replace it. And you start ripping it up. If the community break base are happy for that to happen, you can argue, well, let's just, let's depreciate that and it disappears. Um, and you're not really costing to renew it. It's really going to be the impact of the sub base and what you're going to put back on there. So you, if you start losing that seal, you will have to do some remediation. You'd have to put some gravel back on or something rather than to, to get back a surface. So you're right, if you want to say in the longer term my replacement value is different, um, your depreciation line may flatten out rather than be steep up. Okay. So it's something you'll look at. Yeah. Okay. Thank you just you. have to model it. Yeah, well, you know, as an example, a neighbouring council is doing a similar thing really by letting gravel roads go back to black soil where there's no depreciation. We could be using that argument. Correct, I think more rent is the decided. That's the, the neighbouring council. Put gravel on roads that just it disappears. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're just going to leave it as black soil. So if, if that's where your policy is and your community consultation agrees with that, then and you put that position in your accounting standards and your depreciation model it, I'd be happy to sign off on that. It's just something we'd have to um, assess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any other any questions? Does the productivity of those roads come into the factor? It doesn't affect depreciation, Jeff, unfortunately. But it, uh, I mean, it, would, it, it, it wouldn't be uh, uh, agreed to by the community. We know that. But um, yeah, yeah, we can talk to the community. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the depreciation thing is, you know, the bane of our life, and I think for local government to progress into the future, it's going to have to be reconsidered. As you know, it's now a factor in fit for the future that prevents us from borrowing money uh, from the government money, and. Uh, you know, we have to have debate now whether we're going to seal a road or not. We've got a grant for $11 million, but will we do it because we can't afford the depreciation? Uh, it's not the way, the right, correct way to look at things. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to come down on council strategy, what's your service level is. Um, I'm only just the arbitrator to, to check whether that seems reasonable or not. So. Yeah, yeah, a lot of the councils are continuing to fine tune not just the engineering life specs, but their service levels. And they, they, they rack different roads. So you've got A class or roads down to C class roads, which you can have lower travel rates or lower mm -hmm. traffic rates, etc. And starting to change the appreciation curve there. Uh, I just encourage council to continue to look at it as part of their IPNR and their, their forward projections of capital works. Can you tell me if this is a bit of a left field question, but does the state government depreciate its assets? 
Does it pay yeah, depreciation? Yeah. Funded, I mean? I think it does. I'm not the auditor for our offence. No, but, but you're in the uh, game. <laughs> I think you can look them up. They're probably online. But uh, I think they do. Okay. I was hoping they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone got anything? Whether they, whether they have a future measure. No, I'd, love to, not. I'd love to be able to do that. Does anyone have any questions? As far as acceptability of um, the community about the situation of what you do with the roads, yeah. you know, the alternative situation may be to treble the rates. Yeah. You're yeah. right. Okay. To, co to cover the depreciation. To sell the package, you mean. And that would sell the package. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, we create a rod for our own backs in a lot of ways in that we, we upgrade a road and then the public sees that as a permanent service mm -hmm. level increase. A rod of passage. And I, I don't know that it necessarily needs to be sold as a permanent service of level increase. Yeah, they won't drop below that, yeah, that expectation. Yeah. Anyway, it was, I don't think anybody... Do you have anything, Helen, that you can alert us I to? I spent enough time on that. I know, I know, but I thought it might for our benefit, <laughs> not yours. <laughs> um, all right, Paul, well, thanks very much. Uh, well, I know we're a few months late, but uh, you're here, and uh, um, thanks for your time, and I think I think we've run out of questions here, so... No, no, thanks. Thanks for inviting me, that's fine. And um, I'll talk another time. Okay, thank you very much. Sad, bye. <laughs> All right, well, our next presentation is from Richard, who was supposed to be Oliver. <laughs> I nearly called you Oliver, that's all, but you're Richard. I've got Oliver on my list here. It was Ollie that sent through the stuff for the meeting, so... <laughs> So anyway, welcome Richard. He's not listening to me. Welcome to our meeting, Richard, and uh, thanks for giving us your time. And uh, I, for one, will be very interested in what you have to say. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, councillors, and leadership team. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Uh, and I've got. Mm -hmm. uh, Something works. Do you mind if I switch off places? Thank you very much. Uh, so, debt recovery uh, is a sensitive subject in the community, and there's been quite a lot of change just recently. And so, what I thought, if it was okay with you, I'd give you a little tiny bit of background, just so you see where it's come from, and then the new initiatives that Council's looking at adopting uh, for, for your consideration. Uh, and also talk about sale of land for unpaid rates, which is the sort of extreme last resort um, where rates remain unpaid over a long period of time. Please interrupt at any time with questions. Just very quickly, this is a research-based work. Um, we've undertaken quite a lot of uh, research over the years, starting with the FESL. I don't know if you remember the FESL, but um, the council was going to have to build the emergency services levy on behalf of the state government. Um, and we've been looking at the effectiveness of rates, recovery, uh, legal costs, and more compassionate ways of, of doing it. Uh, because I've got a little bit of information, I might go quite quickly if that's okay. Yeah, and yeah. Just flag me when you, when you have a question. Um, some of the data that we've collected includes the, uh, the rates outstanding percentage that your auditor just said, council's got a great percentage, it was 4.71 last year. Um, council's required to be under 10% of the rates that you build outstanding at the end of the year. Um, and at 4.71, you're in, uh, in really good shape. Um, this is all the different groups of councils, the, the classifications and groups that uh, the state, the Office of Local Government applies to New South Wales councils. And this is, for each of those groups, what the trend has been like for the last 11 years. Um, and you'll see there's been a little bit of an upward trend in all of the groups. You are large rural group 10, which is that dotted line up here. Um, and uh, average is 8. Uh, this is the year before last, the last data there, when you were <coughs> just over 4. So you're in a in very good very good position. Sorry, why do you get the spikes? Uh, the spikes were actually an anomaly. The most obvious thing on the page, apart from the gradual oh, yeah. trend, is that the amalgamated councils um, three years ago 
uh, had their financial year end brought forward to the 12th of May and the fourth instalment was billed but not yet collected. So all of the amalgamated councils had a spike um, and that's subsequently been normalised. Um, the, one of the other bits of data that we found that was really interesting was how much legal fees were being charged to ratepayers. Uh, because suing people was the main device that was used by councils uh, to recover rates. And the solicitors were very influential. Uh, you know, they're trained and paid to argue. And uh, no, no offence intended if there are any solicitors here. I deliberately didn't wear a tie, so I don't look like one. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean to discourage any of you for wearing ties. You don't look like them either. So. <laughs> uh, but the... Um, uh, so if we look at a, at, a, at a range of councils here, this is your group, larger or group 10. This is wider, this is a four year period, how much you spent on legal fees which got on charge to the ratepayers over that four years. And you'll see you were well down from the large group and in the sort of, uh, you know, close to the average of the lower group. Um, slightly higher than it would have been, but you were using a firm of solicitors which were very pushy. Richard, this is just in relation to recovering debt, isn't it? Just debt. Yeah. And so this all gets charged to the ratepayers. Mm. So this council here, over a four-year period, charged half a million dollars to their ratepayers in legal fees. And most of those people were, a few of them were just big city buggers, but mm. most of them were people for whom something had gone wrong financially, either in the short term or in the longer yeah, term. The and they were struggling with that colour. And so this money is going out of the Shire from the poorest people. Super. Um, and often those people have kids, quite commonly, there are, there are kids and there are families, those kids are going to school, there's stress mm. at home, there's bailiffs, some, uh, sheriffs and summonses, and their bank accounts being garnished. And, yeah, so it's a pretty, pretty tough approach was taken. So yeah. As, yeah. As, mm. On the basis of that research, we, um, first of all, we started looking at all the people who had been sued but hadn't paid. And we started going to see them and sort out their problems. So uh, we first trialled that in 2018. 33 New South Wales councils adopted it. And we go and say, look, council's worried about you. Your ex account's getting really large. It might be $30,000 or you know, some significant amount. It might only be five or 10. Um, and they've asked me to come and see if you're okay. <laughs> yeah, you that's help right. if you've been affected by the drought, the mice, the floods, yeah. the yeah. fires, the pandemic. Um, and and do you know you don't have to pay it all in one go? Count, you've got a compassionate council that lets you pay it off and bring it up to date within a couple of years. We try and get them up within one year, but occasionally it's just not practical and we'd rather get it paid off and get the payments coming than do nothing. So we started doing those late stage interventions uh, and then we worked out that just about everybody who gets sued makes a payment arrangement, uh, but they're having to pay off the legal costs. So the payment arrangement takes a long time and councils cash flow those legal costs and a long payment arrangement always breaks and the longer the payment arrangement is the more likely it is to break which just means more intervention more trying to get the person back on track again so we thought why don't we go and see everybody before they get sued and make the payment arrangement then before they got the legal costs yeah so we developed this mentor no rate power in new south wales gets sued until somebody's had a meaningful chat with them see if we can sort out a payment arrangement sort it out ahead of time it's a stitch of nine a stitch of time saves nine this is a fairly new thing, but uh, one in five New South Wales councils are now using it, particularly regional councils. The big city councils don't care too much. They don't know who the ratepayers are. Uh, they don't go to the football. You know, they don't take their grandchildren or their kids and stand next to the ratepayer on the sideline. It's not so meaningful to them. So that late stage intervention, we tend to find that people have got chronic issues. If they, if they got sued and still did pay, there's usually something pretty serious going on. Um, and legal action doesn't work. They often hide. They don't answer the mail or answer the phone. Open the mail or answer the phone because they know they can't do anything. So all they will do is get more upset and more worried. So there's no, it's not rational to open the mail. The situations we find are often <coughs> quite visible from the outside. Um, this one's a ratepayer's bedroom. That's black mould all over the wall. Looks like the office in England. That's, That's uh, the one where squatters were in, made quite a mess. So there seems that you, you know, sometimes you'll see them when you drive past, but that's um, 
that's a uh, council that's that's the same group as uh, he was a shearer with a bad back. I know that's a tautology. Every, every shearer has got a bad back. But, so he's at home like, trying to look after himself. Um, this one, the floors had rotted away. The ceiling, the roof leaked. The floors had rotted away. And I said to the rat pair, who's an elderly woman, are you sure this house is okay to live in? And she said, well, the roof leaks, the ceilings have dissolved, and the floors have rotted away, but there's one room in the kitchen I can still use. <laughs> so it wouldn't be any good for anyone else, but it's okay for me. And we, we always feed this information back to council so you know what's happening in your community and who's experiencing difficulty. Um, this woman had a dead bat in a suitcase that she said she was going to use as evidence to uh, sue council. Um, so some people have got so... It, it's hard to know sometimes whether the mental health issues caused the non-payment of rapes or the, you know, the financial situation caused the mental health issues, but there's often you know, people that have got a lot of stress on board. Um, this is one in Glen Innes where the, there was a rooster in the house. The, the rape bear went down <coughs> and as I walked around the house, the rooster was still crying and it was always on the side of me. So uh, it was a slightly it. unusual situation. Yeah. So just uh, skipping on very quickly, um, it's basically a helpful <laughs> service. We're there to get your money. We're there to get the debt paid. But we're there to do it in a compassionate way, acknowledging the situation of the person and get them to make a sustainable payment arrangement that they can live with and you can live with. Uh, we've got a proper methodology and things that we can use to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we use a bunch of different charts to help people understand because people don't know what goes on in debt recovery. And so okay, we, sort of, we have this process <laughs> transparency chart that explains to them where they are and what would happen next. Everybody knows a bad thing will happen, but they don't really understand why they should act to get back up to date again. So then we decided to do it with early stage intervention, and this is the traditional debt recovery process. Council bills and follows up. They then send it to the solicitors or the debt recovery agency, which has got solicitors, and they will sometimes yeah, contact the council, but they very quickly so. issue a letter of demand and start legal action because they earn all their yeah. money from the solicitors' fees that are charged to the rate. Fees, so they don't want people to pay before they're sued. They need yeah, to sue yeah. everybody. That's the business model. So we've just um, added this piece in the middle here where we send a compassionate letter asking them to contact you and telling them that if they don't contact you, we'll come and offer them help and understand their situation and, and help them make a plan to get out of it. Um, we phone them a courtesy call, we make the compassionate visit, we follow up with them, and a few still go to debt collection. We have to, we have to sue, and we've, we've got three and a half thousand files so far, and we've sued I think it's eight people, and they're just silly buggers, you know, they're people who say, ah, oh, bloody council, this and that, no, I'm not going to pay until they fix, you know, until they don't charge me $25 for a gate to, a key to get to the river or something. So yeah, yeah. we say, look, you can't, argue, you can't not pay your rates, you've got to do it. But they... So very few people get sued. We have this chart, it's a slightly different version. You are here, let's make a plan to stay here which is very useful to help so people understand why it's really important. To... In terms of the costs, what we do tends to cost about this amount. The first two stages of legal action cost that amount. Oh, yeah. And legal action is often a couple of thousand dollars when you add more enforcement stages. Um, the results are pretty attractive. Um, I mentioned that you're at 4.71% rates outstanding at the last financial year. Blaney dropped from 2.84 to 1.46, but we did do a sale of land for them to clear up a few bits of bare land that had been lost in the system. Uh, Tenterfield dropped from 7.5 to 4.62. Yeah, yeah. um, non resident members. That, so yeah. the results are pretty good. And essentially, it's sustainable for councils because you get paid more quickly. The yes, legal process is long and slow, and we get people back on track really quickly and up to date really quickly. Um, it's sustainable for ratepayers because it's easier for them to pay in full without paying the legal costs. That's cheaper. And um, it's probably good for the community. Yeah. The money stays in the community and uh, there's less pressure and stress on kids and families and the whole thing. So that's the things we do instead of suing people to try and avoid suing people and to help people and to be a compassionate counsel. They usually say to us, thank you so much for coming to see me, thank you so much for your help, I've been worried about it, and things like that. And we, of course, acknowledge that they're not our stakeholder, they're your stakeholder. So we say, oh, it's nothing to do with us. 
you've got a compassionate council, you've got a caring council that wants to help you get back on track. Um, so we always deflect the credit. They look slightly surprised because they're not used to people telling them they've got a good council. In your case, it may be different, but for a lot of other councils, people like to beat up on council more than hear good things about them. So, um, but that's just part of the engagement. So that's those two things. Am I am I out of time, or can I quickly? No, 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 no. Finish. You do what you've got to do, Richard. Yeah. So sale of land for unpaid rates. Um, Sale of land is regularly used throughout New South Wales. Uh, it's used by councils, uh, not so much city councils, but all the regional councils use it. Uh, it's to resolve long-standing and growing debts. Sometimes they're unresolved estates of, somebody who's deceased recently or long deceased typically, um, absent owners or chronic delinquent payers. Councils do it uh, for prudent financial management um, oops, sorry, we've got one of our new clients' name in there, I apologise. Um, but keeping the rates outstanding under the 10% threshold for Guida. Um, and um, and it also, um, new owners sometimes don't know they're going to pay rates, so the first house and things like that. Really and the last thing is we want to treat all ratepayers fairly and equally. You know, we can't just say to some ratepayers, we never collect that one, but you have to pay on time. Uh, it's covered by the Act. The Act is uh, quite uh, prescriptive about how it works, um, Section 713 of the Local Government Act. Um, section, section 550 gives council first security over the land. So you've got security over the land ahead of the mortgage, ahead yeah, of the bank. Right. And uh, 713 effectively lets you exercise that security over the land that you've got. Um, it, the, the trigger is that any part of the debt is five years old. So they might have paid a year ago, but the oldest part of the debt is from 2013. That's over five years old. Queensland is three years old. The state government tried to harmonise with Queensland, changed it three years early last year, and they modified the act, but the, it didn't get across the line. Was it last year or this year? What year are we in? Yes, last year. Richard, what you're saying then is that if they've if they're paying off a little bit at a time, but they're still way out, yeah. you can go back to the five years and sell them up if you yeah. so desire. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll just come on to the fact that we tend that nobody gets sold up if they're living in if they're a ratepayer living in the property. I okay. see. Yeah. In practice, nobody gets sold. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it also you sometimes have cleanups. You know, if somebody's a uh, house is half burnt down. <coughs> Kids are, from neighbours' kids are playing in the house. Council gets called on to do the clean up. It's a sundry debt which is not secured over the land. Uh, the rates aren't being paid. You can sell it for unpaid rates and you can also get the sundry debt paid even though it's not secured against the land. The Act allows for that. Mm. Um, typical debts. Typical debts tend to be two different categories. They tend to be quite big debts where there's a decent property and quite little debts where there's a sliver of land. So that typically the properties that are sold are bare land or unoccupied buildings, often semi-derelict buildings. The slivers of land are often uh, where um, a property has got a number of different titles, perhaps a rural property has got a number of different titles, and in the uh, conveyancing some time ago, one block, one of those titles was missed in the conveyancing process. So all of the titles of this rural piece, this rural property, are in the name of the current ratepayer, except for one, which is in the name of somebody who died in 1893, <laughs> <laughs> or, or 1922, <coughs> or something, yeah. um, because it got missed in a previous conveyancing process. There is a way to, for the ratepayer who thinks and is farming that piece of land, you know, which might only be 100 square metres, often they're really quite little, there is a way for them to apply to their solicitor to the um, uh, Register of Titles, Land Titles, to uh, have that conveyancing error fixed, so it doesn't have to go to sale. Um, but road slivers, road realignments, are a common piece of land that's sold. The road now was a T-junction, now goes around the corner. There's a block of land there which is now farmed by the guy over there. Um, he's never realised that it wasn't his piece of land. Uh, and um, the valuer general has a habit of discovering these and telling council and then council has to rate them and they're still in the name of whoever they were. 
On one occasion, we've evicted somebody from a house who was living in a house, but they were not the right pair. In this case, it was the Ford Shark Council. They were a tenant who had not paid any rent for years, and the rate payer implored council to sell it. The rate payer couldn't pay the rates because they weren't getting any rent from the property, and they implored Forbes to sell the property so that they could get rid of this tenant. Because the rate payer had no money, they didn't have the legal pro uh, ability means to evict them themselves. Um, and so when we got the sheriff, and we, we went through all the court processes and had the tenant evicted. Um, and um, as it happened, we have a locksmith always there ready, and the locksmith secured the house. And as we walked around, there were rat droppings all through the house, including in the kitchen. And there were two small kids living in the house. And it was a terrible situation. Um, and there are many cases where the ratepayer does say, um, we want help. You know, I haven't been able to manage it. Can you do something about it for me? So, um, Richard, a couple of questions there. So, um, just going back to what the... Yeah, we're saying there. So, <coughs> so, that, so, what's stopping somebody saying in five years you can, you know, you can get rid of them, right? So they just get up and they say, well, I'll pay the most outstanding rates for that year, and sort of keeps evergreening it. There's nothing to stop them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's. I think that's what, yeah, that's what John was getting at. Was, yeah. And yeah, so somebody just keep, all they do is just keep niggling yeah. and pay five yeah. years ago, and then next year you pay the next the lot yeah. due. So yeah. keeps rolling on and on. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing to stop them, but we do. Um, there are two things in our favour. One of them is uh, most people don't know that it's a five-year thing. There's actually another clause that if it's bare land and the amount of rates is worth more than the debt is greater than the value of the land, council can sell after one year. But that, that's not particularly relevant. It doesn't happen very often. Um, but there's, um, most people don't know about the five-year thing, so they don't know. The second thing is uh, council resolves to sell the properties in a confidential session. And um, once councils resolve to sell the property, nothing other than payment in full will prevent council from selling it. So if they don't know about it and you've resolved, then they have to pay in full. Now, in fact, you can let them off, but we generally say, look, they haven't paid for eight years or you know, 10 years. Mm. They're not living there. So what's the recourse then if somebody's living in the property? If a rate payer is, if a rate payer is living in the property, so if a rapper is living in the property, we do the late stage intervention much more actively and, um, and uh, just try to find some other arrangement. But there are occasions where, um, you know, the person has got mental health challenges and they're failing to cope. There's garbage all through the house um, and they're just ge genuinely failing to cope. And it's better for social services to pick them up and put them into assisted living. And so in our late stage intervention, we, we often bring in somebody from a, a social services function, either aligned with council or just a community function, um, and um, encourage them. It's the where will I go if, if I sell my house, yeah. where will I go? And then we usually get them to voluntarily sell their house. So we get three real estate quotes and, and we introduce them to a solicitor. And so we build a little team for them mm -hmm. and they sort themselves out and sell the property. Mm -hmm. So the council doesn't have to do it. Just plain devil's advocate, going back a couple of slides there, you're saying uh, Tenerfield's collection rate's gone from 3 to 1.5. Yeah. They're probably your best ones. What's your average run at? Uh, well, they all show, we, we knew, we, we started this officially on the 1st of March last year. Um, and so they, those three that I showed were actually the ones that have had a full financial year. Right. They were our pilot clients from the year before. Yeah. Um, so the reason we show them is just they've had a full financial yeah, that's year. Right. That's, yeah. So it wasn't quite as much marketing spin as you were suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> um, tenanted, if they're tenanted quite often, uh, they'll be sold because the rate is not living in the property. The rate has got somewhere else to live and, and they're making money from the property, but they're not paying the rates. Um, there's, quite a, there's quite a complex process. So we project manage it for council because councils usually only do this every two or three years, or four or five years, or six or seven years, so they don't have the institutional knowledge retained in the organization to go through all the process details that the Act requires and, and all the nuances that we know, actually, you've got to do that bit before that bit, otherwise this happens. Um, there's a couple of things. The GM has to sign a certificate um, for each property that we prepare from council's transactions. Um, has to be sold by auction, public auction. There are certain advertising requirements to make sure that everybody has a fair chance. 
from advertising, it can, the auction cannot happen for three months, and it cannot occur for later than six months after the advert. So you've got a three month window in between three and six months. Council and friends and family can buy at auction, but if it's not sold at auction and it's subsequently sold at private treaty following the auction, which the Act allows for, then council and family and friends are not allowed to buy. Um, allocation of funds, if there's a surplus, the allocation of the funds goes to other parties that council believes are owed money, so the bank might have a mortgage. So you've got first security over the bank, if there's enough money to pay you and none for the bank, the bank misses out. Yeah. But if there's some left over, and any surplus that's left over after interested parties goes back to whoever the beneficial owner is. But how does it, how do you actually do this? Um, you're engaged by the council and you've just been engaged by Minor. Um, are you continually auditing, for want of a better word, this, or do you look at it uh, on request from the council, or how do you, how does it operate? It's economical to do a batch at a time. Yeah. So what we're suggesting to councils is because it's now externally project managed, yeah. you don't have to wait three or four years. Right. At the 30th of June or sometime in July at the end of the year, or once a year at some date, have a look to see who's five years overdue. Right. Um, a lot of councils do it in September because the 31st of August after the first instalment was due is a nice due date because these are the annual instalment. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, um, so we say, look, once a year, look to see if you've got five properties, that's the minimum sort of batch to make it economical to yeah. run a project. Um, if you've got less than five, we still charge for five. So um, if the property is very valuable, then council, council recovers all the costs from the sale of the property, yeah. as long as the property sells for more than the rates yeah, yeah. cost. Yeah. Um, so some councils give us one property. We had one council, Goldwyn gave us two properties, but then one paid before the auction. Oh, yeah. So yeah. we ended up with one. one. So that occasion yeah. mm. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Uh, if there's a shortfall, by the way, council writes it off. So um, councils say, look, you know, we're better to write off and not continue to accumulate from a non-paying dead rate payer off it, uh, and get a, new, a fresh rate payer and start to get. Mm. Yeah, up. Uh, risk minimization was the one that you picked up, the small payment to bring them under five years that we Ooh. talked about. Um, so we, we don't allow people to pay in the last 24 hours, because we want to make sure we've got a clear payment. Yeah. Um, and there are people called rogue buyers, there's a guy from Colorado, um, who, and there's a couple of others, who come come along, they advertise the property on their website, they buy it for say thousand dollars, they advertise it on their website as buy your wonderful piece of the great Australian red dirt, get your bit of the outback, you know, um, and they will sell, if they buy it for a thousand dollars, they'll advertise it for twenty thousand dollar deposit, a thousand dollars a month for twenty years, and then a peppercorn to transfer title. They say they'll take care of all the conveyancing, which means a Section 603 certificate is never ordered, so the buyer never finds out how much they owe in rates. Um, and, uh, yeah. uh, and if it takes them, fortunately at the time of the sale, the rates are set back to zero, but if it takes them six months to sell it to some poor unsuspecting person from Mossman or Willoughby or somewhere, um, then, uh, and often there's no road access, there's no DA entitlement, there's, uh, so we try and stop them buying. Uh, because we just think it's better to try and keep those guys out. We know many of them by looks, and there is a rule in the auction uh, section, in the Auction Act, the Act that covers auctions, that says that the vendor, which is council on the day of the auction, the vendor can decline a bid from any person that the vendor believes is not in the interests of the vendor. Mm -hmm. So, and I've actually evicted people from uh, Caban's uh, auction I found out the guy was an agent of one of our band of people, um, which he kind of accidentally admitted to. Yeah. So we kicked him out. Mm. Mm. So we, we're quite tough on those guys, but we don't, <coughs> a few of them get through, but we try and keep them out. And that is, um, that's us. Sale of land. Origin of land. Well, very good. Is there qu I've been quite a few asked going along. Does anyone have a question of Richard? So what would happen next is council would make a list of the properties yeah. and put a resolution, bring a resolution for council to consider, which is a list of the properties, you'd do it in a confidential session and, um, and you would uh, agree to resolve, typically what well, they always resolve to sell it, but you, 
you may debate it heartily, and make your own minds up, of course, mm. but, um, and then we get on and clear those up. It's the only way you can choose who your rate payers are, by the way. So. Yeah. <laughs> We're very proud of our rate payers, Richard. We've been through very, very tough time in the agricultural world, and nobody's defaulted. You know, the made arrangements and pay, you know, paying it off, but generally the the um, the thinking in our shire is to pay rates, and, yeah, and that's evident in our percentage of unpaid rates. But, yeah, yeah. We do have some blocks that are tied up in the villages that come to mind that could are tied up because rates haven't been paid for a number of years, and it's an opportune time to open those mm. because yeah. we're so short of land as well. Yeah, and yeah. then quite often vacant blocks, so it's pretty timely to be thinking about that. Quite a good time to sell too. Mm. They're, they're, they're the sort of things that need to be cleaned up. You know, they're, yeah, they're, they're, it's the opera, people that are operating and in difficulty, you don't you don't really want to sell them up, but it's it's something that's, yeah, if it's a deceased estate or something like that, yeah. Mm. Just cleaning them up. Mm. Uh, and we look after Inverell and Narrabri uh, in Gunnedah, so, um, and 10 to 15, where Glenn and us haven't quite started yet because they've got System, but so we're through all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so we, you're, you're quite con, you're con, very convenient for us to do work. Right. Yeah. It's probably important too because we do have so many people that have entered into arrangements that have done the right thing that those that just refuse to pay anything that we do show that you know we yeah. appreciate the people that are doing the right thing. And yeah. I agree. Agree with that. Yep. Mm. Anybody have anything? No. Well, thank you very much, Richard, on behalf of the team. It was very informative, I thought. And, uh, um, you, if you would like, you can sit in until morning tea or whatever you would like to do. Yeah. Okay. Have we got the next lot here? It's not till 10.30. Oh, they? Oh, okay. It's 10.30, isn't it, Justin, the next one? Yeah, it's online. They're online, are they? Uh, yeah, another thing. Oh, I don't know. That's the... I thought they were attending. I don't have... 10 o'clock, ARTC, Inland Rail. Are they, are they attending Inland Rail or are they on Zoom? Uh, I don't have anything to say. I don't have a team. No, I think they're attending, yeah. 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 So they're that, 10 o'clock. Oh, well, I suppose we can start doing a little bit of business then, if that's the case. Um, <sighs> I haven't asked for... Uh, call for declaration of interest, gifts received, conflicts of interest. Um, no, there's been none. So we'll go into officer reports. 6.1, the adoption of the committee recommendations. Is there any questions on that? Um, if not, can I get a mover of the recommendation there? And so it's the on sorry, six point one on. Um, well, we'll just go through them one at a time, aren't we? The, the technical services report for January twenty two be received, and also the resilience is now be advised. Um, can we do them all in one go? Yeah, we can. I think we'll go through and do them all in one go. If you're happy with that, so it goes right through to page six on your agenda. Mm -hmm. Just yes. Yes. the Mullumbindi Bangalore Flood Appeal. Yeah. We're going ahead with a, an event on Easter Saturday evening at the Oval at Bingra. Fundraising. Having, pardon? Fundraising. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. We're having um, fireworks and live music. And it's raising funds for flood victims. Yeah, okay. And is Lions taking that on or...? Have lines become the the body that are handling They're the money? They're going to handle yeah. the funding because yeah. that way then there's no I'm, payout. It just I'm really pleased to, to hear business. that actually. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's um, at six o'clock we start on the 16th of April at the Oval. Did you say that's Easter Saturday? Pardon? Is Easter that Saturday. Easter Saturday? Yes. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Well, we can go. All right, we'll do all this and then we'll keep going. We need to move on. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Um, so I need a, an somebody move the officer recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Egan, seconder. Please. Uh, Councillor Mulligan, those in favour say aye. 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 No, carried. Well, can I say welcome to our next lot of speakers. Are you missing one? Uh, well, we'll keep going, will we? Not yet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Uh, well, yeah, we'll keep going. Uh, uh, the audit uh, 6.2 Audit Risk Improvement Committee meeting resolutions. Does anyone have any questions on any of that? You can see that um, from those minutes that an intention of this committee, among other things, is to to do a review anyway, <clears throat> with an attempt, not an attempt, to evaluate where we'll be standing at the end of this current council term. And the logic behind that is, uh, because as you all know, we're swimming in grant funding at the moment, and that's going to stop. Uh, and we want to be able to leave, at the end of our term, the council in a ongoing, forward-going financial position. So that the, this uh, committee is going to be looking at that and reporting back to the meeting. And I dare say it'll promote a bit of discussion back at our meeting. Uh, and I, I think also we had a... Do you want to speak on that, Leah or Helen, on the NARU Age Care Facility Review? Through the ARIC? Yeah. I can. Uh, it was a fairly disappointing process, to be honest. Uh, we undertook a review as an internal um, audit. We undertook an internal audit on Nauru. And the most disappointing part was um, the person came on site for one day and Sharon had just submitted an application for a business improvement fund grant. And the actual audit report we got was a rehash of the grant we applied for, right down to what we wanted the grant for, which was succession planning, review of our um, internal software systems, etc. So, very, uh, I don't know if Helen will agree, but it was from, from a, it wasn't what we expected from an internal audit. They didn't look at um, anything really outside of what was in the business improvement grant. So the work was already done for them by um, <coughs> Sharon and I working on what we needed in, in, in bus business improvement funding application. So um, we noted it and just moving forward, but we won't be using that no, it's organisation. Still in, it is still in draft format. They still hadn't, because the... It's a bit like our interim management letters and stuff. They come back with their comments and we agree or disagree with them. Sharon disagreed with several of the comments that they made. So it's still in draft format because they won't sign off while ever, ever there's a disagreement in there. Um, so when we do get the final report, we can send it out to everyone. But yeah, it wasn't quite the process we had. Well, we were sold to in the presentation that they did. Um, it would have been interesting if we hadn't have done the BIF application <laughs> and they actually had to go through and not just be handed a document. So uh, we'll find someone else and refine <coughs> the process for... Because we at that meeting it was also decided that the, the Bingrapool Caravan Park project, um, that would be one of the business plans that the, the committee would look at and the living classroom for the next year planning, which I think are two important areas for council. Yeah. Thanks, Helen. Um, and you'll add at the bottom there that we we're wanting to reappoint the chair, Jack O'Hara, and that should be Roderick Smith, not Roney. <laughs> he, his name's Ian Roderick Smith. So I think that should be recorded correctly. Yep, I've changed it. Okay, thanks. Somebody like to move that recommendation? Well, I'll take questions, questions first. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Those committees that you're forming, the management for the cabinet have been. Are we able to have the council sit on those committees to... So that, the ARIC committee will just overlook what the actual committee... I don't know what oh, that okay. committee is going yeah. to be. Thanks the so. ARIC committee will only oversee okay. what's been yeah. done and, through the other... And I'll certainly report back to this meeting too. Yeah. 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 But, um, it's a kind that, of, it'll be an extra level of, of checking. Yeah. yeah. I'm okay. not sure what those committees will be yet though. Okay. Thank you. No, no. Is there any other questions? You go, you're moving the recommendation? Yeah, okay, Ian Roderick. And a seconder for that recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Any other questions? I'll, I'll put the motion, those in favour say aye. 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 Okay, right. Well, I think our team's here now, so we might stop the meeting for a second. Well, not stop it. We go back to the representations from IRTC, Inland Rail Transform, and... 
and they operate an all-star component. And I think, um, welcome people, too. <laughs> uh, uh, if you're happy to do your presentation, and if you like, probably better to take questions as we go, I think, but we can do them at the end as well. Okay, so you're going, who's first? You, Mel? Yep. Yep. Thank right. you. Hello, everyone. Um, great presentation. Um, I'm Mel Hart. I'm the Director of and I've got Jody Grant here from, who's our contractor from Transform Rail. And then we've got Naomi Tonchek, <laughs> and Isabella Hall from the Central team as well. So, Thanks, Mel. Um, we'll go through phase one first, which is the project that's in construction, and then we'll hand over to Gnomes and Isabella to talk through Central, which is going through its government approvals now. Mel, while that's starting, I've got a question for you. It's a pretty Indeed. simple one. <laughs> no, it's a pretty simple one. Um, we were at a community meeting at North Star the other night, and yep. We mentioned that you are meeting with the community or the the people with level crossings or whatever. Yes. Would you, can you give us a date so Linda can of take? March. Sorry. Thirty first of March. Ah, that's yes. right. That's yep. right. So I thought it was the end of the month, but yeah. I, yeah. yeah. No, so we have met with the individual landowners throughout the month as well. Yeah. Um, but we did say as a group we would get back to them on the thirty first. All right. Well, none of them knew that. <laughs> None of them knew that. Oh, they've all received an email correspondence. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, right. Okay, we can we can resend something out to them. Yeah, yeah. Well, Linda will go to the club, I suppose, and <laughs> tell them. <laughs> um, all right. Mel. Yeah. Comment before you start. Definitely. Um, could you be mindful of um, the use of acronyms and the... I will, I will, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Even so, at a very basic level, end to NS, there's probably people in the room that um, don't understand what that acronym I will, um, is. I will evolve. So we are known for our acronyms. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we'll do a quick welcome to country. Um, so Inland Rail acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and we pay our respects to elders past and present. Um, oh, okay, so this is an overall slide around Inland Rail Gnomes. Do you want to talk to this or do you want me to keep going? Keep going. <laughs> um, it's, this is the program deliverables and what the basic business case was set on. Um, obviously, it's going to um, work towards meeting Australia's freight challenges, which is to do with getting trucks off the road. Um, not necessarily getting the trucking business off the road, but getting trucks to do shorter hauls um, as opposed to the long hauls that they're doing now. Um, we, it's a 33 hour travel time from Brisbane to Melbourne and we're going to reduce that travel time to 24 hours on rail. Um, the safer roads, as we all know, we all live out here and we have B-triple after B-triple on the Newell. So um, as I just alluded to, the idea is to get them to the inland ports and the various rail ports that we're establishing throughout the different communities. Moree and Narrabri have both been earmarked for those SAP intermodal facilities. Um, and uh, we would get the trucking companies to deliver to those intermodal facilities to get onto rail. Um, fuel carbon emissions um, stimulates the economy. So what we've seen already locally within the phase one project is, um, and we'll get to this slide, but at the moment we spend about 18 million in our three LGAs. So that's the immediate stimulus. Um, and then the long-term stimulus is obviously around the SAPs and um, building infrastructure and getting new industry into local communities as well. Uh, this talks about the, um, the transit time, so we go from 33 hours uh, down to 24 hours. Um, the reliability, we are working towards the program meeting a 1 in 100 flood immunity, which means that in theory we should be able to run trains all the time. Um, and a 33, 35% cost reduction um, uh, compared to road. Now obviously those figures change as the inland ports and the interconnectivity grows, which we've seen in the last two years as well. And fuel prices. Fuel, fuel <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> yeah. All right, our project. Um, so, as Narrow Brighton North Star, um, which you will see it referenced as N to NS, um, back in its um, approval stages got broken into two different phases, which is phase one and phase two. So, phase one took us from Narrow Bright through to uh, Moree at Alice Street. And then we kicked in again uh, north of uh, Kamara and went right, comes right through to North Star and goes through the township of North Star. Phase two, which um, the central team have absorbed now, goes from the Moree section, which is the um, wider and Mihai floodplains. Um, so that's the 15 case that got taken out of the initial package, the phase one package. So you will see Narrabri to North Star phase one, phase two referenced. 
Um, they are now completely independent projects and going through two very separate government approval processes. Um, so for us, we're phase one, it's 171 k's of uh, green uh, brownfields upgrade. So we're not actually good, we don't have any greenfield sections at all. Um, we are accommodating 1.8 kilometre um, trains, double stack freight trains. So that's the obviously the inland trains when they run, the uh, capability. Sorry, yep, so brownfield, greenfield. So brownfield is we're using existing rail corridor. Greenfield is the narrow bright and narrow mine project, which is the new corridors being established. Uh, crossing loops, so the crossing loop, so it's a single track bi-directional line, which is just one line. Um, and we're putting crossing loops in um, to allow the trains to pass each other. So um, along the track in our project, we've got five crossing loops. And I know I'm taking your thunder here. because No, that's fine, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we've got a, an immense amount of culverts. So we've got 220 culvert structures going in and 98 road culvert interfaces. Um, we've got about 80 level crossings um, made up of private and uh, public level crossings. And we're also having to go through a relocation of telecommunications and essential energy utilities. So we're trying to get the Telco or Telstra line out of the corridor on the edge of the corridor, which is easy maintenance for ARTC and Telstra. Um, and we're also having to raise essential energy lines to accommodate the double stack trains to get through. Uh, all right, I'll hand over to Jones to talk about this one. Okay, um, thanks. So um, to date, so Transform Rail came on board. Well, it's sort of hard to talk this one and back. Um, so a little bit about Transform Rail. Yeah, if we go just forward to. Uh, so Transform Rail were awarded the contract to deliver the phase one project um, back in November 2020. Um, we started early works around that time as well, but Transform Rail combines the experience of John Holland and C Civil. So John Holland, obviously, um, is a tier one construction company throughout Australia. It's been in here in Australia for 70 odd years, um, with a lot of rail experience. And Sea Civil is a family owned business. They're um, primarily based on the Gold Coast, but do a lot of work in regional New South Wales and mainly focus on civil construction works. Um, so together we, we form Transform Rail. So, um, so, sorry, so there's nobody else involved in it. Somebody tried to give me the story the other day. There was some other partner in there as well. I said, not that I've heard of. <laughs> so initially we had quite a, a, a contract with Romberg Rail. So um, they sort of made up where the four initially came from, just due to the amount of rail work in Australia at the moment. Um, Romberg hasn't been able to come on board initially as what we expected. They are there doing some component of work, but not as big as what we initially thought. So, mm. yes. <laughs> so our tax given the contract there to Transform Rail, Transform Correct. Rail's in the joint venture between C Civil and uh, John Holland. Correct. Right, that's the only structure I don't Yeah. <laughs> and just to qualify just for the phase one project, so Central and Southern will have different contractors on board as well, just purely for delivery. Mm. Uh, so that way, so what you're saying is, hang on, so Transform then, so you're going to have Transform have more partners, or...? No, so Transform's delivering the Phase 1 project that we're talking about right, now. So further south is going to be Trans 5 or something or other. Uh, well, a completely different company, yeah, so which right. these guys will touch yeah. on in their presentation. As, as it is. Yeah, that's exactly right. As it is from North Star to the Border, it's a different company. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> We come in and set the precedent. Talk about that, Alex. We'll go. Yeah, we'll talk about yeah. Um, So this is a map showing the alignment that we have to cover, generally from Narrabri up to North Star. Um, so I know that's not the the clearest map there, but it was actually broken into three packages, so three stages. Um, to work in part of the, so we've got phase one and then three stages and are you keeping up? No, yeah, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> um, but three stages just to work in line um, with the rail possessions that we had. Um, so stage one is that green section. So that's what we call Narrabri to, to Penny's Road, just north of Ballatta. Yeah. Uh, and then we've got stage two, which is that Penny's Road, Ballatta up to South Moree. And then we have stage three, which is uh, North Kamara, so around the Moree Gun Club, up to North Star. Now we started, just to really confuse things, we started with stage two <laughs> works, then into stage three, and we're about to commence stage one work. So just to really confuse... Is stage two complete? Is stage two completed? 
Majority of stage two is completed. Yes, we yeah. completed that last year. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so it might be worth going back to that. I'm sorry. No. Um, so this is just a very large snapshot of the work that we had to deliver. So in total, it was approximately nearly 180 kilometres of track that we, we have to remove. Um, so to date, we've removed 111 kilometres. Um, then we have to reinstall just over 192 kilometres. Um, and to date, it's 36 yeah. kilometres. Um, mm. And then the sleepers removed, nearly 300,000. We've reinstalled 185,000. Um, sorry, that we've removed 185,000 and then obviously installed another 66,000. So they're the concrete sleepers that you'd already see in the corridor that were delivered there. Um, there was nine bridges that we needed to demolish. All nine have now, no, sorry, seven have now been demolished, but we are only reconstructing seven bridges. So, and two of those are now complete. Um, and then the level crossing upgrades that we've discussed earlier. So we can quickly fast forward back to, we can skip that one too, no? Yeah, that's clever. Yeah, over there. <clears throat> um, so even though it is a brownfield um, track that we're reconstructing, we more or less need to take it back to, to the, the ground level and beyond that, so we need to remove it. Um, lay the track foundation so because of the black soil we need to go back in put a stabilized fill back into there to make it stronger we then go and put the bottom ballast on lay the new concrete sleepers um, place the rail and weld and secure that so it comes in 110 meter lengths that we need to weld back together and then lay the top ballast with a ballast train and set the track back in place um, make sure it's all level with the tamping machine I get, I get asked all the time, why do they play tonker toys on the railway line? So we dig it this way, we go that way, then we go this way. Yeah. So what's my response going to be to that way? Why do we have so many issues? Why have we got to break the old line mm. and shift it, but then bring it back again and put the ballast back in? Mm. Yeah, so it's to accommodate the double deck train, so we need to build it at a stronger strength. Is that sort of where you've got the question? And you're using heavier, great, heavier rail too. Yes, yeah. correct, yeah. 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 That's the line that's the base on the top base, hardening it up. But it's not, but yeah, it's because the ash underneath it, isn't it? Correct, so we need to strengthen it. You've got to put upper, you actually get rid of that layer of ash. Yep. Uh, which was put so we reuse it back into the Yeah, that's the field, right, but you've yeah. got to get rid of the layer to stop the moisture staying in it. Yep. Yeah, that, and we're raising it quite a lot too, so we've got to incorporate the old field with the new field. So, I mean, I keep hearing about why they're raising it, you know. A meter and a half or something rather above mm. where the existing line was. Yep. So what's what's the answer to that? A lot of that is to get the flood immunity to the one in one hundred. Oh, flood immunity. Uh, yeah, but some will argue that the top of the hill's not going to flood. If that flood, the whole district will be flooded right out. So it still doesn't need to go up a meter and a half. I mean, you know, where you come yeah. from is at the crossings. Mm. And not like I do, except by the time you've, you've got to put the ballast down and then well, the pad, then you've got to put the ballast and then you've got to put the sleepers and the rail on top <laughs> and the ballast trying to accept some of that. But some people say it's just a bit ridiculous how in some places which are right out of the floods mm. that it's still you know a meter and a half above where it used to be mm. you need to keep that consistency of the rail too so it can't be uh, that's going not that, that argument doesn't win oh, either you're, <laughs> you're going up hill sometimes yeah. Yeah. so so that argument doesn't hold too i mean the, the, to, to me the argument is exactly what you're saying mel is the trains are going to be heavier loaded so you're yeah. going to have a better pace on them anyway so yeah, that, yeah. i can't argue against that yeah. It's very similar to roadworks if um, you are building to a high standard, it's much easier to build up than to dig down and replace. Mm. That's right. Um, so what have we done uh, to date? Um, so as I mentioned, within that stage two, yes, we've done the predominantly, the majority of the work. So uh, just nearly 30 kilometres of track stripped and replaced and rebuilt. Um, just over a thousand culverts installed. Uh, the Gurley Creek Rail Bridge was demolished and then uh, reconstructed. And obviously we re reopened that on the 1st of November in time for the grain season to recommence again. In stage three, we don't, which is the area that um, travels through the Guida Council, we haven't had a possession around that. It's just been given to us and we can operate at our own uh, timeframe in that to a certain extent, obviously. 
Um, so we've really been, um, since since the 1st of November, we've really been predominant in that stage, in that northern section of the project. Um, so to date, we've, we've stalled um, just about 15 kilometres of new track. So that's starting from that North Kamara up. Um, a lot of new culverts have started to be installed. The bridges, so Gilgil Bridge is 97% complete. Um, the Cropper Creek Main Bridge is at 79% and the Trip Bridge, which is right next door to it, is actually fully complete and Yellaroy is 95% complete. So um, we have a lot of level crossings obviously being constructed as well. In the <coughs> so there's some big numbers there up on the screen of, of the fill that we're bringing in and reshaping, etc., to accommodate the new line. Um, Joseph, I might just quickly go back, just go back to slide James and I'll just explain the possession strategy because that might be something that you might actually get asked quite a lot as to why we're sort of shuffling between the project. It's not a linear build. No, one more, just back to the, one more. Yep, so in the northern section, which is the pink section you can see up the top, we've actually got one full possession for until 2023, March 2023. So. There's no rail running along that corridor at any time between when we started the project to the end of completion. However, uh, in the southern section, so between Narrabri and Moree, we've worked really closely with the grains industry and we've come up with possession paths where we take the rail line for seven months of the year and then we open up to grain movements for the other six months to facilitate that industry-wide sort of need to get commodities out to port. So, um, the first possession was last year, which ran from April through to November. We completed stage two, as Jade said, in that section. And then we'll take possession of the rail corridor back again in the 1st of April. And we'll build the uh, between Narrabri and Penny's Road, which is stage one. And we'll hand back again on the 31st of October so that the grain season can then start running trains again in that time. Um, yeah, which goes on to, to what are we doing now. So um, obviously the 1st of April when we take that position, a lot of our works will move back down to that southern section. A lot of concentration will be around that area. Um, we still will continue work up in that um, northern section, um, but as resources are needed back down south, they'll, they'll move between the two. So 1st of April, a lot of our rail crew that are up in this northern section building the new rail, We'll move down south, start removing the existing rail. Once they've done that, they'll come back up here and start building the rail again, while then the earthworks crews move down. So it's sort of that chop and change that's going to continue. So, yeah. Um, so these are the level crossings within Gwaita Shire Council that need to be upgraded. Um, so most of them are continuing with ongoing constructions. The only two that we haven't started yet is um, the 1922 on Cropper Creek Road heading towards North Star and the one on Ivy Ball Road as well just before you enter North Star. But they'll be starting in the coming weeks as well. There was a question the other night on, what was that? on that Ivy Ball Road crossing. Is it going to have uh, audio as well as lights? For want, of, for want of a better word, I don't know. Is it going to have uh, bells and whistles? signals, yes. Yep. Uh, what, sound and light? Yes. Yeah, okay. Because yep. there was then the, was mentioned about sound pollution for the village. But then another lady said, well, it used to be the goods train comes through and blow its horn there every time anyway. So <laughs> it'd be a lot quieter than that. But anyway, that, you might be asked that. Yeah. And mm. somebody also, somebody, somebody, there's, there's only going to be red lights. Somebody gave me some rubbish. There's going to be green lights as well when it's ready to go. Is that right? Just red. Just, just red. red. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The indicator is obviously when the booms go up. That's yeah. not safe to cross. Yeah. 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 Green's a lot of rubbish too, right? Yeah. <laughs> Question on information presented there. We've got uh, nine twenty Tumba Road open to traffic. Construction works continue until July twenty twenty two. So we've still got outstanding conversations obviously around 920. Have, but um, there yeah. shouldn't be any construction work starting there um, on the crossing itself. No, 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 not on the that. roads going in and out. We've just ripped up the line going okay. through there. Um, and obviously most recent conversations around Gil Gil 913 as well. Yep, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, nice. um, so obviously as a project we have a lot of conditions just to adhere to. to. Um, they fall under uh, the State Significant Infrastructure Project, so we have Environmental Protection Licence, 
um, that we have to operate to, and that sort of controls our noise. So when we're permitted to work, which is uh, generally Monday to Sunday, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., we try and remove our works out of townships, like the little villages on Sundays, um, but there is occasions where obviously we do have to, to work. Um, we monitor for air quality, so we have okay. uh, monitors located mm -hmm. along the really areas. Um, again, we test our water regularly, identify flora and fauna. So there is a lot of requirements that we have to do. Um, as such, we've got dedicated teams on the project that work for sustainability, environment, and obviously the community in general as well. Um, so obviously we'd like to be out in the community a lot and obviously um, talk about the project and engage with the community. We have a program as such where we didn't want to come along and just build the track and then see you later. So um, we created what we call Beyond the Track. So um, we have funding opportunities available for community groups. So we just closed our third round. Um, but to date we've given out funding to 23 community organisations. Um, that's across our three local government areas that we work. Um, we've held a lot of community information center, uh, sessions at North Star and Cropper Creek um, and throughout the whole alignment area that we're working. Um, we also volunteer a lot and be part of the community as much as we possibly can. So um, as part of that, we recently um, independently took a um, soil testing report um, for the Cropper Creek um, Recreation Trust there as part of the new amenities block that they want to construct. Um, this is all part of our social performance as well. Um, so these are our latest stats from sort of September 2020 through to January 2022. Um, so when we speak about local, we do talk about um, Gwida, Narrabri and Moree councils. Um, but as you can see there, nearly $80 million has been spent in that time between the three, three local government authorities. Um, 977 people have worked on the project since September um, and a lot of those being probably close to a third being local residents across the three local government areas so um, quite good stats there when we look at them um, but yes any particular questions around the construction <coughs> at this stage? Alex. I have some curly questions regarding the project while we've got you captive in the room um, <laughs> The first one, we've just been through community meetings um, in all of our smaller villages and most recently we had North Star and Cropper Creek. Uh, a recurrent theme at the North Star and Cropper Creek uh, meetings was uh, the perceived damage that the project is doing to the council's road network. Now I passed on to our residents present um, the details of our murder agreement and that we'd done our dilapidation surveys and that uh, inland rail was ultimately bound to uh, uh, rehabilitate or provide funds to rehabilitate um, our roads for damage caused um, throughout the project. I just wanted a reassurance um, for the councillors in the room um, from our guests um, that that is the case and um, we've got no issues with that moving forward. Can we get it? Correct. So obviously, as Alex is well aware, we've been working closely with Alex, our part of our engineering team as well. So we've been conducting some um, road works in the area with the supply of other machinery. So and then council <coughs> supplying the materials, and then we've used the machinery um, to assist with those, those works. So yes, correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, the second one we had. Uh, a comment from a Cropper Creek resident that uh, we had some trees removed that were necessitated by uh, the level crossing construction works and mm -hmm. the request to replace those trees was um, met with uh, request to submit a, a grant application for funding for them. Uh, we sort of see that as um, if trees were removed and amenity was um, impacted, that replacement of those trees with something semi-mature um, is a fairly sensible uh, and not unreasonable request um, and uh, we'd like to have those replaced. Um, with I can talk to that one, Jazz. Yeah. So I spoke to um, a Bill member of the Cropper Creek community and said, look, let's treat it as a Cropper Creek beautification project as opposed to just the tree replacement because we can get possibly more out of it. Yep. So I did ask her to come to council to get the endorsement because obviously it's on your roads before the application comes through. Sure. And then we can facilitate that through the sponsor program. Okay. Yeah. 
So I haven't received any correspondence from that particular person yet. I think there might be some outstanding confusion then um, so, regarding that process that needs to be resolved. Yeah, I can talk to her. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was another query out there. Uh, <clears throat> we saw the, we had, well, Alex and I saw the hydrology report and we were very impressed with it, but the Cropper Creek store is terribly concerned and absolutely convinced that water is going to run into their building where they have freshwater tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just wondering whether you can shoot some levels or something and assure them whether it's right or wrong, I don't know, but they, they said after last storm rain they had or anyway, the water was lying there and they're convinced it's going to come in. So there's a bit of local knowledge for you, it's always handy. Yeah, so obviously can't answer that, but we can certainly commit to taking the hydrologists back out there to have a look at it and do their assessments with mm -hmm. Transform, because I know that obviously Bucky Road has changed a lot in its in its um, level crossing, yep. like with the roads right. going in and out. It was more to do with that too, yeah. 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 And if, if council could be, uh, or a representative from council could be present for yeah, that yeah. meeting, it would be appreciated. Yeah. Thank you. No, we'll take that on that. Yep. Thank, thank you. Yeah. I think part of the perception of that was is because of it, it's sort of you got the railway line, then you got another, you got a pipe, and then you got railway street. There's another, you know, there's another big pipe. Then there's another mm. pipe on the other side. Is what happens if stuff of those pipes? Are those pipes big enough to take a big event? What happens if the pipes get blocked? Because otherwise they're just going to run straight down past Andrew's house and then straight into the store, basically. Yeah. No. Well, we did do some work with Andrew oh, only like two months ago mm. to get a culvert in his driveway there, just mm. so that you know we can sort of make sure that that is running properly. Mm. Um, but look, we can do, have the same conversation with the store easily. Yeah. Yeah. They're good. Yeah. Maybe yeah. mm. Yeah. <clears throat> just another question. The 542 people employed for 26 weeks or over with a minimum of 15 hours a week. Is that 15 hours a week they work? I'll let Joe's answer that because yeah, so that doesn't it's... sound too productive to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. And so a sustainable job is classed at some that somebody that's been in a role for more than 26 consecutive weeks mm -hmm. for more than 15 hours a week. We don't really... <laughs> Our people are generally employed for a lot more than 15 hours. That's a, that's a so day. That's really just a part-time <laughs> position. Yeah, yeah, right. But if they have been on it for more than 26 hours, uh, 26 weeks consecutively, then they would their number would go to that box. But uh, generally, we don't have people doing less than 30. Well, no, it just <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. It's just it's a requirement that is stipulated as part of the counting, I guess, of bringing those numbers together. So it's like, yeah, if you've done more than 15 hours a week. For 26 weeks, you're a sustainable job. Yeah. Yeah. But there's no, yeah, no one does. The majority of the rosters go 12 and 5. Rebels, and five. Yeah. Well, used to be. Days, used to be. Sorry, 14 and 5. Well, and then so. we, 14 and 7, we, we <laughs> okay. go, uh, now I'm going to get confused, then we go you're 10 and 5. Well, so we'll so there's different rosters that come in and out permanently, and then there's a different situation for permanent local staff as well. So there's some yeah, 9 to 5 to. Monday to Fridays, and then there's some 6 day a week job people as well. So yeah, there are yeah. lots of variations of employment that make no, that Can Justin do that? Yeah, yeah, but, um, ah. The indigenous side of it, uh, how many of those people have applied for tenders for doing a lot of the railway work? So we go through the ICN gateway, so we'd have to take that on notice and actually get the actual numbers no, for you. Right. But it's all our tender right. packages go out through ICN and then it's a, a competitive tender process that everyone goes through. A couple of other questions, I guess, while we're rolling. So from the comms point of view, is the perception, well, the, there's a perception out there that the whole, all the way along the track is going to have mobile communications. Oh, well. Is that right or not? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. So I can proudly say that on yes. our part, it's been a big effort. No, so it's only time then why is it? Yeah, so we're actually... Um, well, it's, it, I can answer that. It hasn't started yet. I mean, yeah, it was it, the approval. I was talking to Mark yesterday. Yeah. The approval was given two weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, it's going to happen. I'm yeah. Sorry, Mel. You... No, no, no. You, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you get part of this as we have. So, yeah, we've, we've um, worked with federal government to get additional yeah. funding to get these telco towers put in. Um, and that allows sort of that 10, 15k footprint around the corridor to have connectivity. Because yeah. So, so, so when, oh, so when do you expect that to be complete? October twenty three. Uh, well, it's it's in the hands of Telstra. So as John yeah. said, right. the business case has just been approved, mm. and we're now waiting on timeframes for when we're physically going to see them out here. Mm. But the money's committed. The business case has been approved by all parties, so it's definitely happening. Um, hopefully sooner rather than later. Mm. And yeah. now, just sorry, just going back to the roads issue, what Alex was talking about. Um, 
I mean, obviously there's a perception out there that the roads have been really badly damaged. Mm. And I mean, I know you've done sort of the first bit of it by laying the track, and then there seems, like you said, you all those fellows are going clear south of the ladder there. Then there's a perception there that the roads are sort of being damaged and not being fixed. Mm -hmm. um, when do you, when do, like, when do you, like as Alex was saying, like you've got an agreement, so when does that agreement say we're going to, you know, when does the inlet rail say well, we're going to fix those roads up back to the stand? I know, I think you said video cameras down the Yeah, correct. So when are you actually going to fix those roads up? So it's an ongoing conversation um, and an ongoing process. Um, so we have committed, it got raised um, in quite a few of our monthly council meetings recently, and we've committed to having monthly meetings with council staff physically on site to assess the roads and then to get an approved um, way forward, I guess. Yeah, well, yeah. That, that's the question we get asked because what, yeah. what, when, when are we going to fix the roads? Yeah. And I mean, okay. I don't know if it's one of the weather stuff. No, no. Yeah. And I mean, I know a little bit more than that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's you know, it's just that it's left on the road. Some yeah. of them. Yeah. And we we've worked hard to try and meet those critical movement timeframes, like before harvest. It was a big conversation mm -hmm. and it was a critical conversation. So we were certainly um, active in that. Yeah. So I guess I guess you know, all I'm saying is you need to sort of get out get some information out there about what's going to happen. Mm. Yeah. So that people know that the roads, yeah, we're looking at the roads all the time and really are even with the council to, to do something about it, but we will get there. Yeah. People obviously need a bit of reassurance that something's actually going to happen. Yeah, and, and hopefully the reassurance that things have been happening. Like certainly locals that are using those roads a lot, the Kruval Road was one of them particularly that we have been maintaining that as we've been going through. Yeah, mm. and yep. increased and lime the, on that, so just to stabilise it a lot more. And, mm. Um, I just got a question on the communications. Uh, the towers, are they going to radiate out from the line or are they going to be basically uh, radiate? Line? So the North Star one is in the North Star community and it'll it'll benefit the wider community as well. Uh, Cropper Creek's only a small cell, so it will be based very close to the railway because Cropper Creek didn't have as poor telecommunications as North Star. Uh, Kruval will be on a hill, is my understanding at the moment, so it will impact the wider community as well, to a benefit. Uh, and Gurley is right near the railway line. Yep. That, that was a result of a request from the community, David, that they radiate. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. I'm going to tell me the other day that when a lot of these towers went in, I was talking to Electricity boys, and they were talking about some of the radio towers that we had in Pompstead, and they got something of a very fine line. Yeah. 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 Initially, that was the plan, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Now, the other question gets back to these rail crossings. I suppose mm. you've eaten up plenty of mouth. Topic. <laughs> 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 so, we're about to, we're about to, that's progressing. So, I'll let those jump up and talk about <laughs> <this. laughs> And I guess from so, our point of view, yeah, we, we construct only, so. Um, the design comes to us, we construct it, and then, yeah, so it's yeah. a working yeah. relationship between all of us. Yeah, so look, early early on in our consultation, so I'm going to take you back about a year and a half, we started talking to landowners and they started to talk to us about the size of their machinery, the existing level crossing widths, what they needed to, to future-proof to what they had now in their machinery, um, and to make it safe to get across. So. Uh, those conversations have evolved over the last two years. Um, we've had various different directions that have sort of the project have looked at. Um, it's now obviously reached a pretty crucial point because we're building them now. Mm. So these landowners' concerns are, are very valid because we still need to go to them with the final design um, and what we can do according to our Australian standards with level crossings. So we can't just come up with a 22 metre wide level crossing unless we can meet the Australian standard because it won't be commissioned. So, so why can't the Australian standards be changed? Well, this is the internal process that we're trying to challenge. So yeah. we sort of it, it's it's um, we've got to eighteen meters. So we've got to eighteen meters wide, which is significantly bigger than what they had um, previously. Mm. Um, and we've kind of done a bit of a sense check with the standards. We think we can get that across the line. I don't want to promise anything because we're still uh, working through that in the yeah. final stages now. Um, and then the second request was a, a, um, an alternate safety solution that we might be able to come up with, which just alleviates sort of the, the light, you know, sort of someone tired working 24 hours a day. Um, again, there's no type approved for that particular um, system in Australia at the moment in rail. So even, even if we go down that prototype line for 
essentially for now for our build it's not going to be ready because there's just nothing that's approved in Australia. Yeah, so you actually have got to an over even metre crossing? We are uncomfortable that we can say that. <laughs> well, it's funny, it's funny we're here around the place. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. There's a yeah. lack of communication there so, somewhere. I mean, we'll just pop it on like yeah. No, it's, it's Chinese whispers, I think. Yeah. There is what's going on. Chinese whispers about yeah. that at yeah. the moment. Yeah. Um, and partly because we just haven't been able to go out and confirm know. it, which we will do at the end of March. Yeah. Um, but I will say that this is only for private level crossings and it's only for particular landowners who have an interface of private land to private land. Yeah. So, because we're talking about machinery that isn't RMS approved, so it can't go onto the roads and yeah. doesn't have a registration yeah. against it. Yeah. Yeah. In, the, in the overall scheme, are you still going to have, uh, or is that happening, an app for your phone and tell you when there's a train coming? Again, I would like to say ARTC in their future is smart enough to come up with something like that, but mm. there is nothing approved at the moment. Isn't there? No. Okay. No. Um, but look, I, all these all these sort of solutions are being worked on, um, you know, sort of by all the rail operators as, you know, what technology can do in the future. Yeah. Um, unfortunately for NTNS at the moment, we've just got to, we can only put in what's approved. Yeah, know, sure. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess the other question I asked me, I'll just say, right, um, when, so come October 23, when hopefully it's all done and dusted, mm. and say uh, we get back to Crockett Creek and it gets flooded or something wrong yeah. because the pipe's not big enough. Where's the comeback for those people to come back and say to our yeah, train rail, right. I'm going to need happen. to fix this up and put a bigger pipe in there to accommodate that water? Yeah, so one of our conditions is we've got a 15 year um, uh, review process that we have to go through. So every every stakeholder has 15 years to come back to ARTC. After Did a piece of flood event to then sort of question the model, yeah. we will then have to go back yeah, and review it. Right. Yeah. So, there's, so there's a recall somewhere. Yes, there is. Something doesn't yeah. need to be fixed up. And yet. that's the same as noise and vibration as well. So noise and vibration kicks in for residents at 2025, 2040, when we predict inland rail is at its peak. Yeah. Um, and we still have that recourse for landowners to be able to go yeah. back yeah. and challenge yeah. what yeah, we thought was right at the time. Yeah, because yeah. that's what I do sort of... That's sort of moving on from where yeah. these issues Yeah, and it's a fair up. argument, like, you know, things, weather events have changed so much in the last five years, mm. you know, yeah. That's a good point, but Mel, it's a pity Lyndon couldn't see that hydrology report because we were, uh, well, this is a funny expression, the hydrology report, we were blown out of the water. It was very thorough, very, well, it took three years to produce. Uh, it's been independently verified as well. So yeah, I, I think that would yeah. alleviate a lot of Lyndon's fears and other people's fears about yeah. hydrology. It's, uh, yeah, so look, I, we can sit down, I mean, you've met Rob Leslie as well, Lyndon, so you know what, what your particular patch looks like. Um, but we have seen council the gamut of all of our files, which is sitting somewhere, I'm assuming. Yeah, haven't seen it yet. We, we haven't got it. Or yeah, somewhere, somewhere, yeah. Um, but look, very happy to, it's all public information, so we're very happy to sit down and share it with people. Um, I guess the verification is we've modelled to like the, what we call the Noah's Ark event, which is like the one in 1000 event. Um, we've also modelled to the regular events, so the one in two, one in five, one in 10 years. So we've, we've done the whole set. We've modelled to afflux duration and velocity. So they're the three sort of types of um, movements, water movements that we model to. And Mel, where you were able to, um, correct me if I'm wrong, that modelling was actually calibrated against known flood events. Yes. Like you tested yeah. your model and yeah. inputted the data from previous rain events. Um, yeah. So it, it's tested to some degree. And, and also tested with local knowledge as well. So, you know, we've gone out to every landowner and said, this is what we perceive the modelling shows yeah. in your you know, 100 year experience of being on the land, is that your understanding as well? So we, we've certainly gone out and tested that locally. Um, and where we've seen there needs to be a change, and we have changed, like Titanic system is a massive, has been a huge shift of culverts once we've gone through that process. Yeah. So, yeah. And we're always collecting more anecdotal data. So the recent flood events, um, they flew a drone over that and then put all the inputs in and then tested the model to see how accurately it reflected yeah. where the water went and what was emitted. Yeah. I think just the community needs a bit of reassurance of, you know, if, yep. if, if there is, we do need to change it to the 15 year window, we come back and say we'd like to fix this up. Yeah, yeah no, you definitely. Know, and I think you get a lot more acceptance, so you would. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, look, that's the conditions. That's part of our, our project approvals. People yep. hear it as much, I think. Yeah, definitely. One last quick question. <laughs> <laughs> the, track, the track width is the same as New South Wales, is that right? Uh, yes, that's what we're building to. Standard, so we're right. building to New South Wales. I heard more garbage about that. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Standard, 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 standard gauge. That's how we confuse the matter.
<laughs> but they're all different gauges now, but they're, we're building to the same standard gauge. So when you get into Queensland, you can have two tracks or another track beside the other one, so you'll have like three yeah, tracks range. to run the Queensland trains. Yeah. yeah, so they're just building another bit of rail another in it. Standard and then narrow, so it'll be, yeah, standard gauge and then one narrow gauge track. Yeah, right yeah. on the side, yeah. like yeah. that, yeah. on the coast for running the track up. There's three, three tracks instead of two. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, the other question is one last one. <laughs> I thought the last one was your last one. Somebody told me the other day that now the, track, the track's not going to the port. Uh, sorry. And then some, um, then somebody told me it's going to be tunnelled on from your own pilly to the port. Then so I hear that. Much. But there's existing there's existing track to the port, isn't there? So there, there's existing yeah. network to the port, yes. but we can't take double stack trains from Acacia Ridge into the bridge no. because no. you just don't have time. Yeah. So yeah. No, but grain trains will be. Yeah, I'll try to call. Like it will just it'll be a facility at Acacia Ridge. So you've got to take the so you've got to take the double stack apart, yep. and then you can still go onto the port. Absolutely, it'll yeah. still loop around. So is that yeah. going to Acacia Ridge does, or is it your own pilly? It's Bromerton, but that would break them down. So Bromerton, yeah, Acacia Ridge, yeah. So they'll break them down there. Um, but generally, if you're talking about grain, which is most related probably to this area, they won't be double stack trains anyway. No, no, they'll so go they'll straight through. Yeah. Maybe we'll split it yeah. in half. Down. So, yeah, yeah. Right so it's, it's standard gauge to the port. Yeah, no, thanks. Okay, I think oh, he's exhausted. Yes, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, um, Jeff. You have another right. go. Yeah, yeah well, I missed home. That's right. Um, <laughs> well, have they started? You got one, Max. Above North Star. <laughs> oh, well, What's I will hand over to my colleague. All right. No, yeah. just a, a question that. the other night about the zigzagging yeah, along the road above North Star. Yeah, we've, we've had this quite a lot. So you're talking yep. about how North Star Road crosses it and then yeah, back yep, again. Yeah. We did explore this with um, Gwadishai Council a number of years ago. And um, from our perspective, we can only construct the inland rail project. We can't actually go and redesign roads and realign yeah. roads. So we came back to Council to basically say if Council was interested, we might be able to support that yep. you know, by removing two level active level crossings on our lines. We could contribute that towards the build. But I think Council were... I think it was 50 million or something, wasn't it, to that road through from memory? Yeah, so well, we were very supportive of, of realigning the road and we would have been happy to have designed a road to accommodate it, but uh, yeah. uh, when it came to council and paying for the realignment, uh, that was yeah. totally out of the question. Yeah. Just out, out of interest, is a level crossing a million dollars? Oh, it depends on um, flooding, well, depends on the height, yeah. the area, just all... Yeah, matter of thing, but you're probably better to yeah. Well, I can just say, off that, and two, it really depends on signaling, like with it. What's well, just say the one at North Star then, with signals on boom gates. And well, activation on its own is about a million dollars. So is it? Yeah, activation mm. and then you go construct mm. it. So it's more than a million. Mm. Yeah. Like Buddy Creek Road would, would be more. Yeah. 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 Right. Probably one more really important one, too, is the ninth green at the top of Creek. That we're going to do there. <laughs> 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 Actually, that is on my list of things. It, it's the ninth and the second. There's two that we need to work through. Uh, so, oh, yeah. Yeah. Course, yeah. 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 So, look, I'm, it's right. been on my radar of something yeah. that we actually need to talk to people about for quite some time. I thought the rule was if you hit a train, it was a hole in one. No. Officially, <laughs> 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 no, John, but officially, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we, do, we do want to talk to the golf club and we're yeah. aware that we're actually changing that. Yeah, we um, so we will come up with some sort of funding to assist the golf club in oh, it. That's good. Yeah. Actually, McGregor will have brought that up because I think there's yeah. a the main sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mine does. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, thank you. We'll hand over to the second nice. yeah. 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 one. So I'm Naomi Tonchek and I've got Isabella Hall with me today as well. So uh, we kind of look after what's called the central package and the phase one project does roll into that as well. But um, as Mel mentioned, part of the um, Narrabri to North Star package was pulled out. Um, and I'll let Is just cover that quickly for reasons why that was pulled out of the phase one project. Yes, sure thing. Um, yes, it was basically pulled out. Uh, so that the more complex design over that floodplain could be looked at in greater detail and, and phase one could proceed to construction. Yeah, so this little section just around here is about 15 kilometres has been pulled out and then from North Star up into Whetstone in Queensland is what we're now calling the central package. Um, it comprises of the phase two project, so now right to North Star phase two and North Star the border and border to Whetstone which is part of border to Gary in Queensland. And um, this is our team. This is the stakeholder engagement team. 
Uh, so we've got Lauren and Emily who also work out of the Gundawindi office. Um, Lauren actually is at North Star, so she's not too far from here. Yeah, so you'll actually see a fair bit of Lauren getting she out throughout the community. But to start from the top, so Heather Perry, she actually looks after the project in construction as well as this central package as well. We've got two senior project managers, and I know the mayor and Alex met Adam Barber last week, but we also have Aaron Holmes that looks after that area as well. But myself, we've got Isabella, Emily, and Lauren. Um, we also brought out Freight Connect um, last week to meet the mayor and Alex, uh, and we'll actually bring the Freight Connect out as we get further into the construction side to actually meet the full council at some point as well. But we're not just quite there yet. Um, they've got a few more hurdles to jump before they're officially on the books. So here's a bit of an overview. So we've got the uh, Narrow Ride to North Star Phase 2 project. Yeah. So about 14 to 15 kilometres here That's across right. the Nehuite Water <coughs> floodplain. We've got the North Star the Border project, which is 30 kilometres in New South Wales and 9 kilometres in Queensland. And then we've got the, um, I guess you could say, border to Whetstone section. So about, I think it's about 50 to 60 kilometres in Queensland. Uh, so altogether, the central package is 100 kilometres. So the complexity with this particular section, central section, is that we actually need three EIS approvals. So we need approval for the phase two project, we need approval for the North Star the Border project, and we need approval for the Border to Gary project. So our top end of the central package actually needs approval right to Toowoomba before we can actually start construction in mm. Queensland. Um, we might actually give a bit of an overview of the timing of the EIS. Yeah. It's a bit later in the presentation, but we can go over yeah. now. So um, the most uh, far progress, I suppose, is uh, NS2B or North Star to Border. So we that is current, we're currently negotiating the conditions of approval uh, with the Department of Planning and Environment. So we anticipate that might be around April um, at best, but but we are uh, it could be a little bit later, I think. I think election will get in the yeah. way of an approval. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So our conditions of approval are basically what the Department of Planning says we must do once we're approved. So it's a, a very long list of things we must do. Um, phase two, so we are in the final stages of developing our environmental impact statement. So we expect again that to be on display this year. And again, that provides that period for the public to uh, provide comment on that document. Um, so central two and central three are basically wrapped up into North Star to border. So that's that one um, and then Central 4 we've talked about the EIS timeframes there. In terms of construction, um, so they, uh, sorry, so Central 2, 3 we anticipate to be sort of um, early next year. Uh, phase 2, early 24 uh, and then really Central 4 or border to Whetstone that's really the most up in the air I guess. Yeah so similar to um, how they broke the Phase 1 package up, they've split the Central package up. So we've got phase one down here, which is the Mihai Gwaita floodplain, uh, phase two, phase three, which is the North Star the Border project, and stage four is the Queensland Lake. Um, so the, um, that's all ground field, so existing corridor upgrade in Queensland. Um, it's similar to the phase two, we're mixing up the order. So we're gonna start with C2, C3, back to C1, and C4 will be last. So. And if you've got all that, you're doing really well. <laughs> one, one, perhaps one question there. So when you do the, was it in NS2B, as are the people there coming from Gundawindi down anticipating that? Or where, where's the, the camp going to be, yeah, the workforce? Yeah, so we're, um, as part of the EIS approval, we actually have proposed to put a North Star um, camp at North Star, at the sports club, and we actually met with the North Star um, sports club president and... Uh, Director, I think it was um, just last week. So we introduced Freight Connect to them to actually start early conversations. Ultimately, where the camp ends up is um, going to be determined by Freight Connect. So the contractor that is building um, this package of work. So it's very similar to you know what um, Transform would have gone through. They'll come in, they'll assess, they'll um, determine where they want to put a camp, and then they'll set up a camp. So because Freight Connect aren't fully on yet, so they're going through a development phase and a tender phase. Um, as part of this 29 week, I think Kim said last week, wasn't it 29 26. week? 26 week. <coughs> 26 week um, development phase. Uh, they'll actually come back to us with um, anticipated um, camps, uh, where they're going to set up, you know, all their utilities, where they're going to have site offices, uh, lay downs, everything. <coughs> everything will be included in that package of work. So we actually will get visibility of where they're proposing to put a camp. It, 
you know, Northstar, it's already an approved site, or will be an approved site through the EIS, so we're really hopeful that they do choose that location because it's ready to go, but, yeah, we have to see what Frank can We made it pretty clear the other day that that would have a major impact on our shire and North Star, mm. whereas it wouldn't have a major impact on Gundawindi. Yeah. I tried to put that message across, and I, I think it was I absorbed. Think <laughs> yeah. 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 So just to give a bit of an overview of the, um, I guess, the packaging strategy that they've rolled out across the Inland Rail program, um, the parks to Naramites up the top is actually complete. Mel's package and, and Jody's package are actually in construction at the moment. Um, where all of the rest except for KDRB and someone mentioned the last leg going to, towards the port, all of the rest are in the procurement stage. So they've got the contractors on board and they're now doing the service up and costing up. So KDRB is, we're just waiting to see what happens to KDRB. Will they run trains on, once they've finished a certain set, will they run trains on that at all? Definitely. Yeah. And def we met with the Gundabini Regional Council yesterday to talk about that because Queensland is so far behind and from mm. an approvals perspective. Mm. They keep like looking at it as a holistic project, so it potentially won't be finished until 2027. But the reality is there's rail corridor coming in from all directions. Yeah. So as soon as we've got that track commissioned, you can start sending south, sending to the port in Brisbane, because you can still get to the port even though you're not using it in that yeah. project. So there'll be a new link from New South Wales to Queensland then? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. And Gundawindi Regional Council, they're actually not terribly excited about going to, to Brisbane. If I went to Gladstone, I think that they'd be mm. more excited, but they're actually keen to get the traffic coming south. Yeah. So, and bringing stock and commodities yeah. to the port. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so collaborative framework agreement. So this is what we've just mm -hmm. entered with Freight Connect. So Freight Connect will work parallel to Transform. So Freight Connect are the contractor that have won the bid to come and do the tender for the inland rail project. So that process started in September last year. So Freight Connect is a consortium led by Langro Rourke, so well-known um, T1 company, and, um, and supported by FKG and Toowoomba. So I'm not sure if any of you guys know FKG and Toowoomba, but they're a really big civil um, construction company in, in Toowoomba. They will be doing, as we said, the phase two project, NSDB, and the border to a wetstone section of the project. We signed the collaborative framework in November, and we've just now entered what's called the development phase. So that 26 week phase where they actually go down, they go in, they'll probably start contacting suppliers in the local community um, to actually do up their costing. They'll come back to Inland Rail at the end of that and say, this is what we think it's gonna cost. Inland Rail will have heart attack and go, no, shut your pencil a bit, no. But essentially <laughs> the process is, that they'll put the costing down, hopefully we'll accept it, then they'll be signed up as a preferred contractor to build this package yeah. of work. Mm. So whilst it's theirs to lose, I guess you could say, <coughs> they are not fully on the books yet. Mm. Yeah. Well, well, should we mention the ICN too? So yeah. they have actually opened up their ICN page, so potential suppliers can now register, mm. but it, it's still a fair way off until they'll start actually um, you know, needing those supplies, but people can register now. Probably important note, I just noticed there as well, they will be setting a shop front similar to what Transform have done in Moree. Again, that'll be determined through this development phase. So we're actually not sure where that may be, but it could be North Star. They've got a camp there, they may set up a shop front at North Star. Might be Gunder Windy, completely up to Transform. Uh, possibly both, still, hopefully both. Hopefully both, yeah. <laughs> So we've kind of focused this on the north side of the border package, um, primarily because it's the next one to go into construction. Uh, so as many of you know, that's like the McIntyre floodplain. So it's, we're crossing a significant floodplain again. And um, so we've got a huge number of bridges. We've got a huge number of culverts going through that, massive amount of earthworks coming into that area. Where we cross the Bruxton Way, we actually need a nearly six metre clearance on the highway. So we are ramping up. So what you see there now is going to be a significantly higher track going through that location. Uh, we've got only one crossing loop on that um, particular um, project. It has been through consultation with that community. Originally, it was planned to be up in the floodplain. That caused a huge amount of concern about additional flooding. So we pulled that back down to where I'm sure you all know where Wern is. Yeah, so that's where the crossing loop will be there. Um, so we've got 12 kilometres of new track going across um, into Queensland. It is 39 kilometres of standard gauge rail, but once we do hit the Queensland side, we actually need to put dual gauge on there as well. So our project manager is Irish, and when he started on the project, he goes, so you're telling me that um, you know New South Wales and Queensland you know, built different like gauge tracks, and we're like, yeah, yeah, and he's going, oh, God, I'll make fun of the Irish guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 
Um, got capacity for the 1.8 kilometer trains, but future proofing for the bigger trains, so looking at the future. As I said, we've got a massive, massive field deficit on this project. So we'll be bringing in material locally from all over the area. We actually met with some borrow pit owners last week, so people that have potential quarries, um, to actually start those early conversations with Freight Connect. We've got 11 bridges, um, and the biggest one being the one that crosses the McIntyre. So we've got a huge viaduct going across the McIntyre. Cars crossing, he likes to call it, the project manager, but we'll wait and see. So, sorry, mate. So, you say, you say there, if we're crossing the highway, there's a the ruction on there, it's got to be six metres. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Transport for New South Wales, even though it's not a state controlled road, they did want to have a say in that. And I it might be. We're trying to get yeah. it back to them. <laughs> yeah, so they were very adamant that it had that six metre clearance. I think it's 5.8, but it's nearly six metres. So, mm. it's going to be a significant crossing there. We also need to do a bit of a deviation in the Bruxton Way to allow like, for the, a safe crossing underneath it. and um, I'm trying to think, aquaplaning was a big issue trying, because it's in a floodplain, so we needed to allow for that. Also, Tucker Tucker Road, we've got another grade separation at Tucker Tucker Road. It's been considered a limited access road, so for emergency services perspective, you can't come in, you can only come in from one direction, so that automatically, from an ARTC perspective, triggers that it has to be a grade separation. So that has helped us from a flood immunity perspective. We're up in the air, we've stayed up in the air, we've put bridges underneath it so the water just can go straight through. So, yeah, so we've pretty much covered this really already, I think. Um, I guess in terms, we have started the um, property acquisition uh, meetings with the affected landowners, so that's, um, we're sort of five months down the track, I think, along that process. So it's going reasonably well, I think. Um, we have received evaluations, and I think really they're, they're quite, I think people will be quite pleased with evaluations. Um, so that process, I think we would hope to sort of, well, start to finalise within the next month or so. Yeah, we're hoping to get offers out. So as part of the process, we have to go back to Transport for New South Wales to get approval to submit the offer letters. And so we're just waiting for that final step to take place before we can actually go back to the landowners. So yeah, but as Isabel said, like I think that um, we were quite pleased with the valuations that came back in, so we're hoping that It'll be received well by the as well. So this is a bit of a lot of information on this page, and I'm sure that the wider council are well aware um, of probably some of these concerns. The, the top two for the North Star, the broader project, obviously hydrology. We're dealing with a significant floodplain. The other one was the alignment selection. So. You may hear from our constituents in the area that we should have probably gone back towards Bogabilla and Gron across the alignment. We've done extensive work on that particular alignment. There was no benefit, there was no safety benefit. It's actually safer where we're crossing. We're at a, a pinch point in the McIntyre, so it meant we could get up and get across it. Um, so extensive work has been done on that. But I think we've settled. I think the alignment argument has gone away. But hydrology, as similar to the phase one project, it's an iterative process. We'll keep going back to the community constantly updating, validating. And then, yeah, this is basically the steps that we went through with the community. So um, I think, Alex, you came quite to a few of our technical working groups as part of the development of the McIntyre flood model. Yep. Uh, we took a really hands-on approach with that community uh, because we had the time to do that. So we got the community involved, local flood specialists involved. Um, and it was actually a really rewarding process. We were able to get feedback from the community. And nine times out of 10, they were actually correct. So we didn't have the levies correct. Um, yeah. We, <laughs> You know, some of our anecdotal information wasn't quite accurate. Uh, all of those th sorts of things, the flow rates. So we were able to take the information we received from the community, what lived experience they had, and apply that back to the model. And I think we've got a very robust um, uh, model for the McIntyre crossing now. This is just some imagery. Uh, probably the, the most important bit to point out is our actual impact from the rail corridor. So it's very, very close to the rail corridor. So as I mentioned before, because we're up crossing the Bruxner and up crossing the Tucker Tucker Road, we've got the height, so we've just put bridges and culverts under the water, just is just gonna go straight through. So Yes, well I won't go into too much detail because I guess it's not of particular interest, I suppose. Um, but yes, as we've sort of discussed, it's an upgrade of thirteen point seven kilometres across that floodplain. So uh, just north of the Alice Street crossing, so near the Mac Lanes pub, across the floodplain to east of the gun club, 
Uh, we have a greenfield or a new build uh, just north of the Guida River, so currently there's the Kamara hairpin. So we'll be taking out the hairpin and, and smoothing out the curve there. Um, or at least we will be taking the track out. We may well leave that formation there for flood management purposes. Um, again, 1.8 kilometre trains. Um, bridges, we're upgrading eight bridges. Um, and of particular interest, we are uh, upgrading the bridge, the steel bridge over the Mihai, so the steel bridge, and also the bridge over the Guida. Um, but we are hoping that we might, I, I think we will be conditioned to have a sympathetic design on that bridge, the steel bridge. So I don't think it will be the ARTC typical structure, it will perhaps be a nicer design, I think. So I think that's a good win. Um, flood management, again, we're raising the rail by about half a metre across that floodplain, and we'll be putting 1,100 culverts in across there. So there's the upgrade of the bridges, and then there's an additional 1,100 culverts to go in um, at this stage. That's for the draft design. Uh, level crossings, we're upgrading uh, the crossing at Gwydefield Road, Back Valley Road, and Rocks Road and then we're upgrading or rebuilding some of the private level crossings as well. Uh, that's the key points. That's it. Yeah, so the Border to Gary project, I can skip over this if it's of probably no interest to the council. I yeah, think it's a significant project. Naomi, I understand all that. I think with the, the time we're on, we, we, I'd like you to, to cover your whole program, but I think once you get out of our shower, it's probably not. Yeah. 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 Just a quick snapshot of the oasis, yeah. so you know, we've, and also the water is close, yeah. And other communities. I think that's the last slide, isn't it? Yeah, and then questions. Is that it? Well, we can take questions. We've got another, well, we were supposed to have another Zoom meeting at 10.30. We've put them off to 11.30. So, and we might have morning tea with you. Uh, but if there's any questions, or alternatively, you can ask them while we're having a cup of tea. Um, is everybody satisfied? I just, I just want one question. Um, is this line will ever become passenger line or is it freight line all the way? Yeah, well, my standard response today is never say never. At the moment, it's just for freight. Just for um, freight. Just really, we're building to take that double stacked um, freight movement. But never say never. I mean, in 20 years, things may change. I mean, you, you could be. Explorer might come up. Yeah, Explorer <laughs> might come up to North Star. You At could, the moment, you, you could take on the Garn or, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. the Pacific. Why not? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, certainly in the short term, the Explorer is still stable, so Maury doesn't go any further. Oh. Yeah. Oh. All right, well, look. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, yeah, yeah. Kind of Maury and Copper Creek and through North Star, the grain that's going to be moved out of those silos there, they're going to be on a separate, they're going to be in the old style right. track? Uh, no, they'll be using the inland tracks, so there's two different um, depots oh, but, but uh, yeah, you said there earlier that the, the track's going to change again to go to the port. No, so in New South Wales, we'll have the same standard gauge all the way through. Yeah. We're upgrading the inland rail line at the moment, but you'll notice that ARTC Hunter Valley are also upgrading parts of their line as well to take the 30 tonne, well, TAL they call it. So uh, Narrow Brighter Tarra one, so you can get down to Newcastle, is now being upgraded by ARTC Hunter Valley as well. So there are other projects in the what we call the CRN network, which is the country rail network, that are also being enhanced to make sure that we can try and get the bigger trains through to port when we get them on track. Are you be taking standard gates to the port? Yeah. The port. Yeah, that's yeah. the question, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, so all your trains, all your grain trains that run out of here will have that train passage all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. Any other questions? Look, thank you very much to all of you for a wonderful presentation, very informative. Very good. Uh, and uh, I think you have answered a lot of questions. Um, and, uh, you know, it's hard, difficult with the community, isn't it? I, I know that um, as Lyndon has uh, demonstrated with these questions, he's getting them straight from his people out there, and um, a lot of it's very ill informed. But I, I guess that you can see that now, maybe there's, we need to do something about that. Yeah. And look, if we're open, if there is any events that you've got or anything that you think it's appropriate for us to be at, we will be there. Yeah. So, like, because we do have community events, we don't get a huge roll-up to of people who, who come to talk to us. So if there's a more appropriate way for us to communicate, please tell us, and we will absolutely be there. We will be at the Warriala show, we'll be at the Maury show, we'll be at the Gundy show. Um, but if there's anything else that's happening within the community, we'll be there.
Is Pride Connect going to be at the Royal Show as well? Not the <laughs> <laughs> hey? What's that? No, no, I'm talking about Pride Connect. You'll all be in the one tent, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Transform will and us all will, 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 will be there. I don't know about that. <laughs> no, no, I'm talking about Pride Connect, whether they are going to be part of the team. This is the, the contractor doing the North Star of the board a bit. But anyway, it doesn't matter. They're, they're, they're too busy getting ready to accept yeah. the deal. Next year. Next year. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I wasn't talking about sponsorship, I was talking about presence. Yeah, 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 okay. Oh, probably, probably too soon, isn't it? Next year will be fine, I'd say. Yeah, your tent will be too full. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll take a break, have morning tea, and we'd love you to join us, if you could. Yeah. But I'm sorry, that's how I saw oh, well, it. I think we're all sick of this criticism. Well, I don't from, think you've offended anybody because... I'm sick of this criticism from Mr Tremaine that's unfounded and very inaccurate. Yes. Very and inaccurate. it's time to clear it up. Okay, I've okay. got a motion that... Uh, you've sorry, got a question? Yeah, I'm voting for the You're motion. You're voting for it. I'll put the motion. Those in favour say aye. 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 Against no code. Thank you. 6.6 uh, .6, uh, LEP. Uh, this was talked about a lot at the community mm. meetings. I'm looking I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, does anybody want a question on it or comment before we, before, before I go for a mover? I just wrote a couple of things. Did you? <laughs> well, I just wrote, I wrote water here. Did, I don't know whether the whole thing's ever explored all the water issues that we have in the country before we open up to um, this. And I know that some of our farm areas, if they put a second cottage on a granny flat or whatever you want to call it, have to put a lot of water in for um, bushfire mitigation. Oh, yes, I haven't noticed any of that sort of being said in here and I wondered whether it should be. Wouldn't that be in the current LEP though? Well, this is an, it seems to be a new regulation well, that they're yeah, this is introducing. An I, well, yeah. I read it, it's an addition. And, uh, or so a, you think a it'll, pick up, it, it'll pick up all the old plus... I thought it would. Is that I right, didn't look at me like an additional layer. Yeah, yeah so yeah. I thought... Because I think for the building, if you put in for a building DA, I think your risk, yeah. that, that, that all comes out the with the water risk fire risk that's that yeah. you're going to have. And I don't think that will alter this. This won't alter this, that. This so this will be in addition. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I, it, for a rural area, it seems to me to be favourable. Well, I think it's favourable, but I just want to make sure we're well, that being the case, would somebody like to move the recommendation? I'll move the recommendation. Councillor Dixon, thank you. And Councillor Mulligan has seconded it. Is there any further questions on this? I don't want to rush it through, but um, I dare say everybody has read it. All right, I'll put yeah, the motion, those in favour say aye. Aye. In snow great. Now I'll get lost as to where we Next point is. 104. Uh, thank you. I knew it was right at the back. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you wouldn't have. <laughs> yeah, <I'm just> <laughs> okay, yeah. so the March monthly investment. That's the February, we've got the wrong title in there. That's what, it's actually the February monthly oh, investment. Oh, no. um, oh, so it wouldn't be March, would it? Yeah, no. Mm. We're a couple of days off that. So I can take any questions if anyone has any. Yeah, how come you can't get a decent interest rate? You think? I hope you all enjoyed the presentation from Richard. Regarding yeah, the, it was very good. The, um, the collection. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. was very good. I commented to him that I, I like the softly, softly approach that yeah. he's outlined. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully we'll move forward with him to do both the, mm. the early intervention stuff and then also his team have the expertise to be able to do the sale for unpaid rates. Um, easily and I think it's probably not a bad idea in our community that we do have that third party that yeah. that is doing that um, for us so I'll bring that to council next month to, to get approval to um, get the list they, they come into our system and they pull all the data out and so it's all done exactly how it needs to be so that there's no because I've been here 10 years and we've never done it so I don't have the expertise and it's a pretty finicky process and we don't want to bugger it up. Mm. Well, I did appreciate his 
it was complimentary to the way things have been run and, and, yes, and the yeah, percentage, yeah. which is very good. Uh, Our but, clientele will be different to a lot of councils that he does in that he, they have a lot of people that are outstanding that they come in and fix up. We don't have a lot of outstanding. We've got people on payment arrangements. The drought caused that, that people did put their money mm. in on a fortnightly plan and stuff. But we have got those tricky, difficult ones that either continually lapse or just do stick their head in the sand. So mm. once again, a third party might be the right approach to have him mm. make the call and, and visit mm. these people and just... Mm. Oh, I think we've got a duty to those that do pay their rates to yes. do that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just looking at it, it looks as if the cops that we would incur is hard by employing them. Yeah, oh, yeah, so... Well, a lot of the costs, once it gets to legal, that's all recoverable by council. The first step's not recoverable by council, but we, our, our resources within finance, Chris Riley has now retired and we haven't replaced that position. So we're down half a person already and that, to, to be able to offset where we've got mm. our accounts receivable person now doing more and now taking on accounts, above, it'll work out a much cheaper option mm. for council. Essentially, uh, it was half a position, wasn't yeah. it? So, that the, and probably more some cases that was responsible for debt recovery. So, this has been taken away, yep. and we're only paying when we need the service, mm. not a, not a yeah. half person yeah. every week. There's not the, the the wages component that we've got to pay all the on yeah. costs and. That's uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Helen, uh, we wrote off a debt of ninety grand for Gunny Wallaby. Mm. Can can we reactivate that and get this bloke to chase that? Or is that could we do that or not? Not not through them, no. If if the courts had another decision, we can go back, I think. But until... We're so far down the list. Because it was a Section 94 contribution, wasn't it? Yeah, it wasn't a rates thing. It was Section uh, 94. If it was rates, then right yes, we're, we're entitled to it. But <coughs> it wasn't... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was a, yeah, it was Section 94. It's contribution yeah, to yeah, yeah, repair. Yeah. We're on the road. Yeah, we lost so, that. <coughs> yeah, right. it's, it's right down the list. Yeah. Uh, uh, so Helen, uh, so this plot sold has been contracted for how long, or is he? We haven't engaged him yet, but this was the presentation today. I'll pull out what his fees and all that mm. sort of stuff are and bring that to council next month to, to you guys. So has he got a minimum term, like two years or five years? Oh, or no, I know. I wouldn't imagine so. He's relatively new to the game. He originally was with another debt collection company, um, and he branched out from that because he didn't like the hard approach that they had. Um, so he's building up a client. Clientele. This is his own company. Yes. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Would he be on a retainer type of thing, or was it per? No, it's per stuff. Per, so it's, yeah, it's mm. yeah. out, it's all that So I think he said. Yeah. Didn't mm. he say that to enact uh, uh, one particular thing was two hundred dollars? Yeah, hundred ninety dollars. Yeah. So mm. we we can't recover that one. That one, I think we can. Well, that well that's an advantage yes. because the, the way we were doing it before, we recovered nothing. Yeah. Until it became illegal. Until it became illegal, yeah. 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 So yeah. they get a letter to say that we're coming, you're in breach, we're coming, it's $189 for us to visit and work out your arrangement. If you don't want us to come, you have to contact council, mm. otherwise that debt becomes payable. Yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And mm. the same as the sale for unpaid rates, it'll be a thing that we do in the next six months possibly. We won't look at it again for another five years. We don't have the rate base where we're going to have a consistent amount ticking over five years all the time. Mm. And it's got to, you've got to have enough to make it viable too. Mm. So. I think we should look into that. Oh, I do too. I thought yeah. it was very yeah. good. Mm. Uh, he's not, not, not going to ride roughshod over people. No. Yeah. yeah, all right. Is there any questions of Helen on uh, her report? Mm. Mm. Very good. I'll move the report, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Galton. I'll <coughs> for a second there. And I've got one with Councillor Smith. Um, Put the motion, those in favour say aye. Aye. Against, no going. Now, I would like a, a resolution to go into confidential session and listen to council reports. We could have that from somebody from the floor. Councillor Egan, seconded by Councillor Colton. Chin back on. There was okay. actually no business. There was no business, no. It was just discussion, so there's nothing to be recorded from that meeting. I thank you very, very much for your attendance. It's been a long session, and uh, I declare the meeting closed.